Hello Avatar fans and welcome to the next episode of the Avatar Online podcast. This is going to be episode 248 of our regular shows and we're recording this one on uh, July 30th, 2022. This is the official podcast for the fan site AvatarTheLastAirbenderOnline.com and I'm going to be your main host Morgan Airspeed Prime. Joining me on the podcast is Greg, Greg2B from the site. What's up everyone? Excellent. So on today's show, we will be starting our coverage of uh, the new Avatar novel, The Dawn of Yang Chen. So we will be going over the first third of that book. There'll be three podcasts that we do to cover the book in full. And um, so this will be the first third of the book, just over 100 pages. Then we'll do the second third and final, the final third, um, two podcasts from now. And um, before that, though, there is some pretty important news to cover, including... We did actually get some relatively big news from San Diego Comic-Con, so there's a bit to go through here. So we'll start off with the news, we'll get to the SDC stuff later. First we have to start off with actually the most recent piece of news here, and probably the most negative piece of news, and that is that some new Avatar Funko Pops got announced. But it's a surprisingly complicated situation here. So it's Avatar Legends cross Funko. And initially, when I first saw this, I thought, oh, they're just doing some weird digital thing and that's it. You know, OK, people who are interested in NFT stuff, go ahead. It doesn't really affect me. Looking into it more, though, you realize that, no, wait, the way this works is that you buy these digital packs of cards, either five or 15 for 10 or 30 dollars. And you pull basically, yeah, digital pops. But if you pull some of the really, really rare ones, you can actually, like, in a way, like, redeem that co- digital card for a physical copy of that figure. Which would be fine if it wasn't that all these pops are, like, exclusive and a lot of characters that people really, really want, and the chances seem exceptionally low. So we have a. Fire Nation Ang here, which is listed as a Grail, there is uh, 999 of them available, 0.16% chance. Uh, the next four are all, there's uh, 2,125 each available, 1.36% chance. So there's uh, Bolin as Nooktuk, The Painted Lady, Avatar Karuk, and Varric. And then there's also uh, Funko Freddy in an Ang costume, which I believe you get by collecting all of the cards. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't think that includes the previous five. Like you don't have to earn the other five Funkos, I think, to earn the Freddy. But it, it it's something like that is how it works. You have to get all the other ones, all the digital cards only, and you get this one. So. People are pretty annoyed about this because uh, obviously uh, NFT stuff is pretty controversial online full stop. But now you make it even worse by having like a, a digital random trading card pack system on top of it. And only the really rare ones unlock actual physical Funko Pops. Um, this just got worse and worse as I figured out how this worked for me. Uh, I don't like this approach the only real hope I have coming out of this is that they end up announcing the next waves of Avatar and Korra Funko Pops and we have kind of equivalent Funko Pops here that we get like a different Varric. They use Karuk in some sort of another thing. We get a different Painted Lady. We get a normal Bolin. That way it won't make this as bad. But for collectors, a lot of people are just like, I'm never getting all of these because of the way that this actually functions. So what are your thoughts on this kind of coming out of nowhere? The NFT Funko Pops for Avatar. Yeah, I definitely I don't think I saw it coming or anything like that. But I guess the way that things are trending with everything in the digital space of ownership of items, I guess it's not too surprising that, you know, a franchise as popular as Avatar would have, you know, something in this realm at all. But like you're mentioning, the sort of being blocked behind sort of the chance ability of getting them and that being linked directly to redeeming a physical version of the pop which you know understandably can be quite you know upsetting if you know one you just like these characters and you just want them 
and then you know even more so for the people who you know like this is their their thing and they're really trying to collect the whole set of them so that definitely puts a, a damper on that and like you mentioned like some of the chances to get some of these like you know i don't think the chances on any of these goes above like two percent or even a percent and a half so you know considering that these are digitally limited that you know doesn't inspire a lot of confidence in getting these so you know it feels like it's going to be much like you know the race to the real versions of these which you know i don't know the stats on those um in terms of like what they produce since they don't normally give you out like you know how much do they make physically and how much they can you know get after that and stuff like that but here right up front you can see you know the limits so i mean if you really wanted to you could do the math and see what your actual chances are you know in theory of actually getting these and then you know there's the whole idea that even if you do get these um, you still have to wait like a period of time to actually get them, which means they're probably not really, you know, made yet at all, which because they also do say, I think somewhere up here that like these aren't like the final versions of how they actually look or anything like that. So, you know, there's still some consideration in terms of like what the final results of these are is actually going to look like as well. So, I mean, you know, the, the idea, you know. The, having the digital isn't, you know, the worst thing in the world. There could have been a lot, you know, other things that could do with that. But the fact that it is, as of now, from my understanding at least, you know, locking some of these characters behind this for only, you know, the availability to get them at the secondary market, which, you know, the prices for that are never usually pretty great if you want to get them, doesn't, you know, it doesn't really seem like it's potentially the best way to go about them. I don't know. Yeah, like I put up a video on this like as soon as I saw this and for the most part people mm. like were in agreement on it but I did get a few of the people like the the really people who are super into NFTs and are like, "Oh, I know how this works, you know. You're thinking about it all wrong and that like you don't have to interact with the system. Like you can just buy it from the secondary market." And the person was trying to make a like a, a good point that like look at this value like some of these pops the legendaries will only be going for $80 and it's like what <laughs> like like they, they don't realize that that's the problem that you're you're they're viewing 80 dollars for one of these things as being value but they only view it that way because that's the best value you can get out of this system whereas if the system wasn't mm. here this would just be a 15 dollar funko pop or maybe a little bit more if, in the, if it's an exclusive to a certain um retailer um that's the problem because it gives you all the details here in that like, okay, there's two different types of packs. There's 31,250 of each one. So there's 62,500 packs overall. And um, I think if you add that up in terms of money, uh, Funko make like a one and a quarter million dollars. And then obviously if you sort of divide the number of actual physical items that there are, it comes out to like roughly $80, which I think is what, where people are getting the, that's going to be the average like uh, value of these things. With the idea uh, being that the the ang because it's rarer will be more uh, worth more, uh, and then because the the Funko Freddy one that that seems a bit weird in that there's the most of that, but it also is kind of one of the more complicated ones to get because you have to like get the rest of the cards so you you have to buy a lot of packs or trade or like buy NFTs from people and that just seems like a whole kind of mess of a situation as well when. If this was just a new wave, they just called it Avatar Legends, they're now combining Avatar and Core together under one banner, and this was your lineup of pops, that they have the, the Funko Freddy there for the Funko collectors, and then, like, new character, Varric, new character, Karuk, Painted Lady, um, Bolin as Nook Tuk, um, Aang, I think people will be relatively happy with that. There'd maybe be questions about, like, why Bolin isn't just normal Bolin, but... I think people will be like, yeah, this is an interesting, varied wave, an avatar, a new Korra character, a spirit, <clears throat> a spirit, and then a memorable, like, Aang redo. That's, that's quite a nice wave. And it would set the stage for, like, oh, they're going to do stuff like this going forward. But most people have immediately switched off because of the, the system in front of this. And I think everything points to the fact that when these go live on, what is it, August 9th? These are going to sell out immediately. I don't think there's any way that these packs are going to be left waiting there. They're going to sell out and 
there's going to be some kind of crazy market stuff. My guess would probably be that they these these ones will be worth a little bit more because the Avatar ones seem quite popular and collectible. So you'd be lucky to get some of these for 80, um, I think. So I I don't know. Um, I hope we get other waves that this is just a separate thing that happens to be for the most part for Avatar collectors, I suppose five exclusive pops here but that they will do other ones. Like, I do ultimately feel we will get a proper Bolin. And I get a feeling down the road they'll do something like fancy Funko Pops with the past avatars. They'll do something like that. Because the, the Kuruk is nice, but it is maybe a little bit plain looking, the, the, the one that we have here. It's Varric in his fancy clothes, so I think they could do a no more normal looking Varric without the sort of cape thing going on. And... I don't think it's the end of the world, but uh, it's not a good sign, I think. But uh, do you have any thoughts on, on what will happen from here? What does this mean maybe for the actual line of Funko Pops and so on? Yeah, I mean, I do wonder if they are producing like a typical wave along the same lines of this. I mean, I just wonder in terms of like, you know, where they're putting their resources if they do have the... You know sort of bandwidth to do both of these at the same time because i mean they're still they still have to go through all the process of creating these and making sure they're official and making sure they're licensed and all that stuff since you know this is a, a cross with avatar legends so you know they have the full you know approval and everything from nickelodeon so it's not like they're just doing this on like a complete whim i'm sure this has been in development for a while now um but yeah, I just wonder, you know, how far along the lines are they with the other one? Because usually, you know, any of the like, you know, rumor or the pop sort of like, you know, uh, Twitter accounts that are always like saying, you know, this is what's coming soon or we got the exclusive, you know, information on what's coming. Normally those ones would, you know, say something ahead of time, which I don't know if there was as much for this, but that, you know that always makes me wonder if that really is coming along down the line. So I don't I don't know. I mean it's I guess it, you know, like you said, it isn't the worst thing ever, but it just, you know, with everything else, it just doesn't bode well in the percentage of actually getting them. And with them, you know, like you said, for sure going to be sold out. I mean, I just, I don't know. I really wonder, you know, what your chances are really going to be in getting this. Because, I mean, if you have to spend for like, you know, four packs of the premium ones and that only maybe gets you one of the ones that you actually want to get, that's like you're essentially already going to be like, you no, know, overpricing on what people are assuming is going to be in the secondary market. And, you know, that's if we assume it's best case scenario, because I don't know, I, that, that seems a very like idealistic price for it to be 80 bucks. Like I wouldn't be surprised if it's like double that or, you know, whatever, at least in the initial wave, like, you know, sometimes after a while, the prices will sort of like, even out, not even even out, but just, you know, come down a little bit, but that's only after like an extended period of time. So in the initial rush of things, like, you know, like anything else, people are just going to put the price up as much as they think they can get. So if you think you can get 200 for a pop, which I wouldn't be surprised, you know, you're going to put the price at this. So I don't know. I guess we'll have to wait and see how it actually goes down. It just doesn't feel like it's uh, the best case scenario for a new line of characters that is going to be digitally exclusive, I guess. Yeah, like uh, I've seen a lot of people just very upset about like I've been getting like all of the Avatar Funko Pops and now this effectively makes it like impossible mm -hmm. for me to get them all without just like completely breaking the bank <laughs> to, you know, second force you to go to the secondary market, of course, because the, the idea that you get all of these from just buying packs, like how many are you actually going to need to get to get guarantee you get all of them? Who even knows? Um, so we'll, we'll see how it works out. But um, anyway, we'll move on from um, digital packs to physical card packs. And this one's actually kind of positive here. Uh, the trading card game Y Schwartz has announced that they will be doing an Avatar The Last Airbender set. So uh, this was quite exciting. Um, the actual tweet doesn't have much information about it. Um, just Avatar The Last Airbender, Y Schwartz, English edition original, which I it would assume that means it's not getting a Japanese release or whatever. Because uh, I think this game is Singapore based, if I remember correctly, Bushi Road. Um, so we'll, we'll, we'll see how that works. But in the video 
they go over a little bit more detail about how like they, they wanted to announce this a bit earlier. They had some final things to kind of like solidify before that. I think they still are saying that they're they're planning a, a special name for the set or something like that. Um, but what they do say on their kind of release schedule is that Avatar The Last Airbender will be getting a trial deck plus a booster pack and a supply set. So trial decks are just this game's version of starter decks. The plus, I believe, means that it ha- it will have the potential for even in the, tr- the starter deck for there to be signed cards. So I'm very interested to see how they do that. Uh, otherwise, it, it might mean something else. Booster set, of course, is as you would expect. It's going to be a set of like 100-ish cards and that will make up most of the cards in the game. And the supply set, looking at other games' supply sets, is that that looks like it's going to be a uh, deck box, uh, card sleeves, promo cards, and a couple of packs of the booster set. So it looks like they're going all in here because uh, on their release schedule, the only thing that has the same lineup as Avatar is Attack on Titan. So that kind of tells you that they're they're quite excited about this one. So um, it's a pretty cool card game system um, that I I quite like. Um, yes, if you want the best cards, multiple copies of the best cards to make your deck, you are going to need to buy a lot of booster packs. But the thing with trading card games usually is that there's like set ratios. So if you buy a booster box, you're guaranteed to get a certain amount of each rarity and and so on. Because the print run is much bigger than the digital print run, uh, it seems a little fairer and the secondary market is going to be a bit more reasonable than whatever nft stuff is going to be working out as i like this idea it's cool i do wish avatar would get its own trading card game but this is a step in the right direction and i think they said something that if this does well they would like to do a cora set um but i don't think there's too much official on that but uh greg your thoughts on avatar getting a weiss schwartz uh, tcg set yeah no i think this is pretty cool i mean you know We've had one before that was, you know, interesting and it had some interesting bits to it that we've, you know, mentioned over the the years and whatnot. But uh, no, I think this is cool. I'm interested to see how they look and how they design them based off of, you know, how they've done their previous sets and stuff like that. Um, So no, this sounds cool. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, from there, we'll move into some of the SDCC news. So the first one, um, I think the first thing to say is that I think we talked about the panels last time out and neither of us were like super positive going in that we might get news. It felt like there should be news, but there probably won't be. There was actually news from both panels, but uh, obviously with the Brave and the Elements panel, it was minimal. But it was still nice that we got something. It was kind of big, it really took off. And that is that uh, Janet Varney, who I guess ultimately wasn't able to actually attend the event in person uh, did a video that they I think they aired right at the start of the panel and they posted everywhere and she just made the announcement reading the Kyoshi novel um, she announced that the first feature length Avatar movie from Avatar Studios would be about Avatar Aang and friends so this goes against some of the rumored information but ultimately you know it's them moving it around this made sense ATLA is going to be up first. Um, very interesting announcement. Um, obviously, there were some people disappointed that they're not going for Kyoshi, Kyoshi first, but from a business point of view, I think this makes the absolute most sense. But I don't think it's lost on most people that Janet Varney was holding the Kyoshi novel as she said this, as she referenced rumors and people speculating about it. And it, I think it makes it clear. Part of the reason that they made this announcement was, one, I think they felt like they had to say something, and then two, they felt like they had to say something because people had been going crazy speculating about rumours and so on. This was just to clarify, this is up up first, even though there's no details or visuals to go along with it. What were your thoughts on this? Were you surprised at all that they said anything Avatar Studios related? Uh, I guess I was surprised a bit, just... uh... The fact that they're, you know, I guess saying it directly at this point in time, but I mean, the, what they actually chose to say isn't too surprising. Like you said, from like a business standpoint and, you know, just general popularity, like, I don't know, it would seem odd to me, even though the Kyoshi book did so well and we're here to talk about, you know, the next book that you know, I'm going to assume is going to do very well as well, um, that that would be like the first one. I mean, you know, it wouldn't be. No, I don't think it would be bad or anything like that. But, you know, in terms of popularity, you know, 
the main core characters from the original series is the most popular thing ever, which is why it's still going. So it's not too surprising there. Yeah, like the the feeling I get is that they probably will do ATLA movie, Korra movie, then Kyoshi movie. That that I think makes the most sense. That's like this sort of in a way order of mm-hmm. popularity. Like the the books are hyped right now because um they're relatively recent, but Korra overall I still think has like a slightly more kind of mass appeal until like people really get into the Kyoshi books, more people read them. But uh, that is that. Don't think anything else happened in the rest of the Raving the Elements panel. They literally just posted this in the middle of the panel going on and not much else. Um, Then we went to the publishing panel. So this was uh, Abrams Books, Dark Horse and Magpie. And apparently only Dark Horse really showed up to this based on what we we heard from this. Uh, FCE was there, answered a few questions. The timing probably wasn't really right because the book had only been out a few days at the time, so he probably wasn't able to say too much. Uh, Magpie, it felt like, didn't have anything to say at all. Um, But Dark Horse needed to say something and did. So they announced some comics. First up, they announced a a standalone, I guess, one-shot comic, Avatar The Last Airbender, Azula in the Spirit Temple. This is uh, by Faith Aaron Hicks and Peter Wartman, our usual creative team, Adele Matera, Comic Craft, Summer 2023, more details to come. So they're saying basically we'll get the description for the book uh, and a proper release date when the book properly goes up for pre-order. But we did get the cover. Uh, it's pretty nice. It's uh, Azula, of course, walking into what we guess is the Spirit Temple in what looks like her, her normal style outfit. But she does have a tattered cloak on. She's doing some blue fire bending. There's normal smoke on the ground and then there's some sort of a pattern like smoke spirit type thing going on above her head it's intriguing and interesting and is probably if they weren't going to announce a trilogy this is probably the best other thing they could have announced that that's my general thoughts on it but uh greg what were your thoughts on this as the avatar comic announcement yeah no this definitely is like probably you know a highlight story that they could have done that's a one shot that everyone would really be interested and invested i'm sure people still would want more information and i could see this like you know by the end of this comic not really like resolving anyone's like big questions that they have about azura but you know who knows we could get that in the movie that we know is coming now so i wouldn't be surprised if it's lined along those lines but no it definitely looks cool I, the cover looks interesting i'm sure there's a lot that can be dived into on it mm-hmm uh, one of the things said about it, uh, Faith Erin Hicks, of course, posted about it. She's the writer. She te- she says, um, ridiculously excited about this book. I get to take Azula on a super dark journey. And Peter Wortman knocks it out of the park. It's the Azula story I've been dying to write. So um, she's definitely had a bit of an arc here as the as a writer here, initially not wanting to write Azula, <laughs> then being like, oh, I'm open to writing Azula to suddenly like, it's the one I've been waiting to write. So um, that's nice to see. And uh, yeah, immediately everyone is speculating. Everyone is hyped about this because it does have potential. So the immediate question, where is it going to be set? Most people would want it to be set post Smoke and Shadow because we haven't really had any content with Azula post Smoke and Shadow. Um, It feels like it's either going to be there or it's going to be a fill in the gap book between the search and Smoke and Shadow. I'd be very surprised if they went back into ATLA for this just because I, I don't anyway, don't really know what they would be doing with Azula at that point in her story. Um, Whereas I think if they do it in between the comics, they can use it to explain, say, like Azula's uh, change in perspective a little bit. They can explain her perspective on her destiny, not wanting to be Fire Lord. It happening just after she's had what seems to be her first encounter with spirits in the search um, would be interesting to see her have another spiritual uh, experience. Um, it doesn't inherently look like it's full-on Kamura Kage Azula from the image, so this might be before that, because of course she has to break out the other Fire Warriors um, to establish that group. But who knows? We, we won't know until we get the description, and even then the description might not even tell us uh, that much. But it is sort of notable. A lot of smoke here uh, on the cover, um, and the pattern is like, okay, is that something resembling the kind of spirit wolf type dynamic of like showing us where like the mother of faces will show up because it it very much resembles something like a face 
But uh, what do you think is going on here? What are your thoughts about the, the, the time period the book should be set in and any thoughts on what the cover says to you? Yeah, I don't know. I think it would be cool if it was something that really did reveal, you know, some insight to her character and, you know, what she sees going forward for potentially the Fire Nation. I mean, I don't know. I don't know if it feels as as it would line up with something that's sort of like after the mainstay of the events that we've seen in the comics so far, because that might be leading things forward too far. So I think the safer bet would be to put it in between things um, just to sort of clarify things and open up more, you know, I guess, thought process of what the character is actually having. Um, I mean, it's interesting that, you know, it's a super, potentially a super dark story for her. So this is something along the lines of her getting to another, like, low point that's going to force her forward in some sort of way. I'm not really sure. Um, but yeah, I mean, I didn't you know. I don't know. It's always hard to sort of gleam stuff from the covers if this is really linking to other things. I definitely do see the idea that it could be a face, but, you know, it could really be related to anything or it could be nothing at all. So I don't know about that specifically yet. Um, but no, I think it's definitely, I don't know, I think it's just cool that we're getting more of her story, even if you know in the grand scheme of things it doesn't really push things too far forward but mm -hmm. you know any clarification is always nice to have and you know the fact that it's about azula is you know a popular character so of course it's going to do well regardless yeah like uh this is, this is definitely one where i'm kind of like okay i know we're excited about this but it's a one-shot comic they have not been the like most yeah. amazing things so far this is not going to be the azula story she's not going to meet ursa in this this won't be the redemption it might have elements that show the potential for that arc to happen um we'll see um about the best i i think i'm hoping for is that like if she does meet a spirit that maybe the spirit does the whole like insight thing with the forehead and like shows her a vision of her destiny but maybe it's a dark spirit and it shows her like a you know misguided kind of vision and that's why she it seems like in smoke and shadow she's made really good progress but she still wants to force zuko to be the fire lord she would have been and that's kind of the issue in that book is that no you don't understand that that's not needed like at all um so uh, I'm, I'm interested to see where they go with it there but um they didn't say that this is the a part of like a one shot trilogy but i'm guessing once they're done with this i'm guessing faith aaron hicks and peter wartman probably will go on to another one shot avatar comic and um, that just seems to be the way be the way they like announce these books in a way like it's always in groups of three otherwise this would be the first like actual true one shot but what are your thoughts on on that do you think this is likely going to be the first of three one shots or is it completely on its own Hmm, that's a good question. I mean, with Azula being as popular as she is, I mean, I could see them doing a standalone, but I mean, it seems like they like to keep things in groups and sets, and you know, that's just like sort of a typical thing to do. So, uh, I don't know. I think I could see them doing more, but I don't know, because it's really hard with how they're trying to line everything for the movies and stuff. So, I don't know. I'm sure there's other stories that they could put in between that, you know, could work just as well. But this seems like this would be such a highlight. You know, like, what would you follow up with this that would be just as important? Like, would you, like, go and throw something with Iroh or, you know, some other character? And we know they can't push things forward too far anymore because of the movies and everything. So, there's, you know somewhat limited with what they could do that would make it as interesting at least in my mind right now but who knows yeah like i'd immediately go for like yeah say iro and maybe something that at least gives you an idea maybe not full backstory but like a little bit of an insight into his background um would be nice and then like Sokka space sword journey would be nice that's always like a fun thing people will need to see him get that back at some point since we know he has a sword in the future um, which is the other thing about the ATLA announcement. It wasn't part of the official announcement, but Avatar News did come out and basically say that, oh, um, my big reveal that I had prior to them even announcing that it was going to be Ang first was that I had news that the Zuko movie that he was talking about was going to be with the characters as young adults. 
And he altered that because this news came out to be like, well, I'm guessing the Zuko movie is this ATLA movie, so it is likely going to be with the characters as young adults. So that, I think, is why we are continuing on with Avatar one-shots and not doing a trilogy for Avatar is because I think they're very much clearing the path for them to... They have a good amount of time to work with for that movie, and then maybe we can get back to stuff. Which is why I think this, if it is post Smoke and Shadow, it will be like just after Smoke and Shadow. Otherwise, I do think it's probably going to be set beforehand. Um, do you have any thoughts on that? Because because I know a lot of people were criticizing Avatar news for like, you know, get your news straight in a way, like you're chopping and changing things on the fly here. But um, I think people are being a little harsh when like he obviously is getting a certain amount of insider information behind the scenes that is probably from an earlier point than they're actually at like officially if you're if they're actually you know the people involved in it or where they are up to date um i think people are being needlessly harsh here when i think most of his information probably does come from a good place and he's doing an okay job at trying to work with that but what were your thoughts on that little addition to the uh, avatar movie announcement yeah i mean I don't know that that seemed like it would fit in line, like almost like regardless of anything. I mean, I think it's, you know, the the order of things and sort of, you know, keeping up with things and how they're sort of changing. And it, it seems like a lot of this is in flux. So, you know, I would suspect that it's kind of hard to keep that in line, especially if you're not directly involved with the project and, you know, they're actually announcing, you know, the news directly, Avatar Studios, which as of now, you know, there still isn't any sort of like direct outlet that we know of that's actually doing it. So, you know, I don't know. It's kind of hard to keep with that. So I, I definitely can understand why some people would be upset with that a little bit. But, you know, as far as we know, for the most part, you know, most of the news from them, you know, has been pretty much on point for the most part, um, you know. So I don't know. It's, it's a hard thing to go with that. Yeah, because I think that's just where we're at. They probably do have like five, six movie ideas that they have an idea of like, okay, it, one of them is going to be HLA, one is going to be Korra. There might be a solo, more focused Zuko movie in there as well. There is a Kyoshi one in there probably. And they're thinking like, do we go new first or, you know, solidify ourselves with the nostalgic stuff first? And it seems like here they have finally settled on. It makes complete sense. HLA first then go then the demand for that atla one is sort of gone for for the most part and they can be more free with what they want to do um the other announcement was they did announce core comics there's not much details on these but they did say finally once and for all there is a new legend of Korra comic trilogy on the way creators are kiku hughes as writer i believe and alexandria monique as artists they will begin in 2023 more details to come. So no actual information full stop here other than we have a writer who w did write Clear in the Air. I think that's the most recent core thing that she's written. Um, she did art, Kiku Hughes did art on Origami from Team Avatar Tales and then wrote Clear in the Air, the free comic book day book. Alexandria Monique this was, I think, most people's first time hearing about her on Korra. But as we'll go into the next piece of news, she is actually an artist on Patterns in Time, which we only found out about sort of like after the fact. But this is big. You know, we, we all but had a Korra comic trilogy confirmed like two years ago. That seems to have been scrapped. This does seem to be like a new thing completely and not just that finally happening, just based on the fact that they have no exact concrete information just yet this is the one that's coming out i think after the azula comic so they probably had to scrap whatever they were doing initially but um what are your thoughts on this uh finally more core comics on the way yeah i think it's good that we're finally getting like an official official sort of announcement with this and people attached not that that's always like set in stone as we've seen in the past like things can change things do come up um but you know the fact that they're announcing it you know during sccc and you know they're making it a point to show that you know this is happening it isn't being thrown to the wayside like it sort of seems like it has been for the past whatever amount of time um definitely gives it a lot more i guess strength behind what they're actually saying this time i'm sure we won't see it for like quite a while like 
if we get it next year, that would be like amazing. But even that, you know, might be too mm-hmm. soon, or maybe we'll get like one part next year or something like that. Um, but no, I'm definitely, you know, interested in seeing it. I wonder how it's going to align with things. I'm sure that this, you know, since it's coming out post Avatar Studios, it has to sort of fit with whatever they're going to do in the movie and everything like that. So maybe this will be some sort of tie in or something like that if they're even that far in development with everything else going on. But no, I think this is a great news that we're actually getting for once. Mm-hmm. Yeah, a lot of people very, very excited about this. Um, and the creative team looks quite good. Um, obviously, people are immediately going to want Fire Nation story. Can we please go to the Fire Nation? That's what everyone's <laughs> been asking for. It seems like a very obvious thing to do in that... I, in a way, like I question... like I don't know if just going to the Fire Nation and the gimmick of the Fire Nation would maybe be enough for a full-on movie, unless you have something crazy going on. So this could be a way to have, like, okay, we'll put out the Fire Nation trilogy and that clears a really a big thing fans want and then they can do something bigger because the core comics have not progressed things in sort of the same way as like the avatar comics have they could go in like a variety of different directions the overall like ongoing plot point is just slow and steady progress with the human and spirit dynamic so it feels like that might be something they focus on more with a, a main plot otherwise it's, it's very difficult to predict whereas i think with atla they're they are a little bit more boxed in because we all we know is that okay republic city stuff happens at some point and so they have to tell a story that revolves around that to like a certain degree so uh, we'll see how that goes but we go on to information like i said patterns in time uh, i forget if i've announced the latest delay on the podcast or not but it's now out november 29th i forget if we mentioned that last time or not it's been delayed by another week i think i forget if we said it before but the news here is kind of really random because I don't actually know how long this post has been up for, but I believe I was the first one to bring it to light that, hey, this has been up here this whole time. We now know about one of the new Patterns in Time stories because Alexandria Monique was listed as a creator on that book and on her uh, ArtStation account, she posted sample pages from it. And if you look at her profile, uh, it says it literally says worked on patterns in time on the comic cat Owl's cradle so yeah confirmation here directly so uh, this looks to be a milo focused story that is sort of also it kind of turns into milo and boomy focused uh, it is another sort of milo with animals thing i guess but it also looks like there's like what these sky pirates involved here as well mm-hmm. so this could be quite fun um it's not obviously i think what we really really are looking for i'd be more interested i think in a genora story an Iki story kai opal because this book is also going to have lost pets in there so there's a milo story in the book already and i've seen a few people expressing some disappointment at that like another milo focused one but the art looks incredible in my opinion uh, it's so accurate and detailed um if if she can keep up that quality for an entire trilogy and this isn't just sort of like deluxe art because it's only 10 pages um i think we're in for a treat here because everyone's been incredibly impressed with what we see here especially given that she shows it at the variety different stages of the progress as well uh, uh, art progress as well so uh i'm really excited for alexandria monique's art on on the new trilogy and um, and this looks at least like a solid story so what are your thoughts here Cadell's cradle and your thoughts on alexandria monique's art yeah i think the story you know depending on how it actually goes could be you know i mean you know i, I know milo can be, sometimes be like a hit or miss character for sometimes for people especially with like the way that he acts um as a kid but you know he is a kid so i, I guess it is pretty in character for that um so yeah i guess you know it really depends on on the story um for the short ones but you know they're short they're not like the mainstay thing so it might not be the the worst thing in the world regardless of it um yeah and in terms of the look yeah it definitely looks uh, amazing i think 
think, you know, it is cool that you do get to see the progress here. And if you look at her main, like, art station page, you can see that she's done other Avatar stuff as well. Like, she's done some portrait stuff and some other character stuff. Um, so, you know, it's something that she's done before. And just, you know, their style overall looks pretty good. So, yeah, no, I think definitely if it, you know, does stay at this quality for um, anything else that this artist does, that's definitely going to be probably one of the, the better ones that we've seen so far. So definitely positive in terms of all of that. Mm -hmm. So that leaves us with a weird situation with uh, Patterns in Time where there's probably two or three more stories we don't know about. Um, and obviously there's a lot of demand out there for what they should be about. I see a lot of Korosami fans worried that there won't be a actually Korosami focused comic given what the cover is. And then the other thing is that this seems to suggest, unless he happens to appear in future pages or that we don't see here, Mako still is not in any of these uh, one-shot comics that are going to be in this book. Any of the free comic book day ones or the new ones we know about. He doesn't appear in a single panel of any of them, but he's listed in the description. So it doesn't suggest Mako has to be a focus character in any of them, but it's at least saying he will be in the book somewhere. So... um definitely some weirdness going on there but um i don't know my, my expectations are quite low for this book ultimately um especially now that this doesn't exactly like excite me outside of just the art quality um Cadell's cradle so they, they're really going to have to deliver with the remaining two or three stories um but where are you at with uh, patterns in time if it ever comes out yeah, if it does. Um, I don't know. I think with the delays that it's had, it definitely has put like a a downer on my sort of like hype scale for for this book in general. I mean, it definitely seemed pretty interesting, and it seemed like it had the potential for a lot of new content in it, which I suppose it still has. You know some that's going to be featured into it but not as much or maybe not as many sort of like impactful stories as we thought it might be but again you know it's not like a trilogy or anything like that like it's its own sort of like standalone thing so i suppose there was really only so much you could really you know be invested in it from that standpoint but you know i get anyone who's a fan of the, the ships and stuff in that 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 would you know be a, an obvious thing that you would think would be part of it right like that seems like a a clear thing to me but you no know, maybe that's just not what they're really going for despite you know the cover yeah like uh i suppose technically like the team avatar tales cover was not really representative particularly of anything in the book it's a little bit more generic than the quite like crazy looking patterns and time cover but um still people are going to be annoyed if there's no direct core Asami. Um, so yeah, we'll move on to our main topic for this podcast, and that is the first of three uh, podcasts discussing the dawn of Yang Chen, the brand new uh, Chronicles of the Avatar novel. This is uh, book three, but it's Yang Chen book one of two, as far as we're aware right now. Um, so yeah, we'll be discussing the first third of the book here, but we'll also do just some initial stuff here to start it off, just so that anyone sort of following along gets up to speed with who the main characters are in this, uh, an idea of like where we are in the world and so on. So um, I've had the book for like the entire month. I got the book very, very early. It just arrived very early. Uh, otherwise, most people, it's like towards the end of like week two of having the book. Um, I've seen a lot of general like positivity towards it, um, but um, that it is different than the Kyoshi novels. So We'll get into some initial thoughts here on the book. Uh, I suppose I'll start, we'll start with you, Greg. I, I've had so much time to talk about this book. Yeah. What are your thoughts <laughs> yeah. on the dawn of Yang Chen overall? So overall, I really enjoyed it. I mean, I think it definitely does have a different feel from the Kyoshi books in terms of, you know, how they're going about developing the scenes and developing the world. But I think depending on your preference for storytelling and stories in general that this could either be more intriguing for you or less intriguing for you depending on where you lie on that scale um i think i remember you telling me like early on that you no know, this is a lot more of a a political book and it definitely has that feel to it um but i also think that the book in general 
it's very it feels like it's more i guess reflective or influenced by our current sort of like media tv show movies sort of like consumption and style of storytelling compared to the kiyoshi ones um just in terms of how you know the story overall is more like it's more sort of like cloak and dagger it has a lot more sort of going on behind the scenes you know maybe there's not quite as much action as you know you would think there was in sort of the kiyoshi books um just based off the characters and what their abilities, although when you do get them in the story, I think they are quite good. And, you know, maybe some of the elements of sort of bending are used in maybe not as, you know, in your forefront face type of ways as they might have been used in Kiyoshi, where, you know, you could see that, you know, that was like her whole block was her whole struggle with that and the fact that she was hidden versus in this one. It's a lot more in your face that you actually, you know, see you know someone who's more along the lines of like ang where you know they're more in tune with their abilities and that's more in the forefront of things so that's not necessarily what's holding them back um now there are other elements of yang chen which i'm sure we'll discuss that do hold her back which you know as to the more i guess depth and dynamic part of her character um especially when you see her interacting with like you know the main character of the other main characters of the story itself um but no i think it definitely is a different story it definitely has more intrigue to it at least to me um and i think you know depending on your preference it may be a better one of the three that we've gotten so far and i think it might lie along those lines for me personally mm -hmm. yeah like like the, the big thing here very different uh, than the kiyoshi novels the, the kiyoshi novels like the highlight of them is that kiyoshi is in such a weird position at the start like it's kind of crazy what's going on like there's a false avatar you get these crazy reveals about what like kiyoshi's own backstory is and she's like 16 17 and only just discovers she's the avatar versus in this book yang chen's the same age but is a fully realized avatar so it's like very very different the, the Hoshi book is very like they're key things that shake the life of uh kiyoshi versus for the most part this book starts off as sort of just another day in the life of yang chen trying to be a competent avatar and then the machinations happen and it develops into more of a world incident as the politics come into play and i've seen a lot of people say that uh, they like the politics and so that is what makes this book better for them i have seen other people say that they find the politics to be a little bit dull and so the better sort of minute to minute action i suppose of the kiyoshi books uh, worked better for them um i i think for me a lot of it comes down to the fact that um this very much feels like a part one that the next book is going to be a direct continuation of nearly every plot point from this like nothing really gets like completely wrapped up in this book and i can see people being maybe a little bit frustrated by that but it means the setup is that that book could be really really incredible versus the with the mm. kiyoshi books rise works on its own there, there's setups for things to happen in the next book most for the most part it is resolving everything and it just has those kind of key points of yoon and past life uh, karuk stuff for the next book and they, they play with it in that way and then shadow sort of works on its own as it's that story but this book is about shang cities and the zongdus the next book is going to be about shang cities and the zongdus but maybe also including the other world leaders as well so they're going to expand but it will still be the same general things um and and that's the thing like uh, i've seen some good comparisons of like it's also a similar thing like between atla and cora they're they're different types of shows yes you can compare them but uh do you have to do it like constantly i think there's there's value to this uh, we're always going to like the stories of like the the avatars being like forced into a crazy situation and having to adapt on the fly but it is also nice to get in a story about like a very competent avatar just trying to accomplish something and, and a small incident turning into a bigger incident. It's more it's more typical in a way, and, and, and I like that. And it allowed you to explore some more subtle plot points that maybe you couldn't do in the Kyoshi books. Um, 
like for me like i i I would probably still lean on the direction where right now i prefer the kiyoshi books to this but it's still like three out of three for for novels being amazing and if the the fourth book delivers this one could be brought up um so it's it's still quite close to me because I, i i've really had a chance to kind of go through it through all the chapter analysis videos i did for youtube to see that there's a lot to this the, the characterization here of yang chen and kavik is strong and if they deliver it's gonna work really really well but slight preference towards kiyoshi right now but uh, wh- what about you on that like uh, in terms of uh, an order you kind of alluded to it with what you said before but uh, what would be your order for the books at the moment yeah no that's uh, that's a good one um i mean i think in terms of the first books, like if I'm just comparing the first two, the first books from each of the series so far, I probably would put this one on top just because of how I don't know, I like how the story plays out. You know, for me, the politicalness of this one hits the beats for me. It has more of the like cloak and dagger, hidden spy sort of thriller aspect of it, and you know that's something that stands out to me as something I like in terms of like the full complete set. Yeah, I mean, I still would go with the Kyoshi for that one just because I know how that one ends up and I know how it flows together. Um, So that's where I would lie as far as that. And I think, you know, the point that you mentioned about this, you know, feeling like it's definitively a part one of a part two story is something to keep in mind. I think, and I remember saying to one of my friends about the book that, you know, I might be upset at the end if it really ends on like, you know, one of those sort of like huge cliffhangers and now I have to wait, you know, X amount of months or whatever until it comes out. And while it does sort of end with like, you know, a clear point that stuff is going to be needed to resolve, it didn't it didn't irk me as much as I thought it might potentially have as, you know, typical stories do when they have, you know, a big thing at the end. Like, yeah, there is, you know, the one thing at the end with Kavik that you're like, okay, is this what it's going to be if it's not going to be? But I think in terms of, you know, you can see what's going to have to be resolved and you can see that, you know, there's potential different ways for it to be resolved is enough where it doesn't, pay me as much if that makes any sense in terms of where the story's going because at least i can see where it's going it's not it doesn't feel quite as nebulous as other sort of season breaks might actually feel mm-hmm. um at least that's my current you no know, feeling with it it may it may change it may change depending on where they actually go with it in the end um but that's my current thoughts for it at least yeah like i agree with that like you don't end this book feeling that like oh it's like really bad that they didn't resolve anything because it's not like you say it doesn't end on all cliffhangers and that to some degree there isn't really a really just blatant like cliffhanger it's all just that this was a complicated situation and even though it's been resolved this issue here if information about this gets out this will turn from being like a 8 out of 10 level kind of threat incident to being like a 9 or 10 uh, threat incident. And, and that's the setup. It's like <laughs> the ticking time bomb effectively of things are going to go wrong. Like the news will get out there, but what can Yang Chen do in the meantime to make that happen, to make stuff happen, to to, to make amends for that? So it's 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 an interesting one, definitely. Um, I, I definitely think um, when I read it like, initially and just did my first review i was kind of like yeah i think i clearly prefer the kiyoshi books but going into yang chen a bit more it's like it's a, it is only a slight preference for me um they're all very very good um so uh let's uh, jump in here with uh, just some sort of like specific discussion on some characters maybe some of the world building i think we'll start with the world building just because it's, it's so important to sort of like understanding what's going on in this book so <laughs> Our, our effectively like Dao Fei equivalent for this book is um, the idea of the Shang merchants and also the Shang cities that they sort of like rule over. So we learned that there are these four Shang cities. There's Bin Er, which is kind of like the main one for this book. And that is your sort of Northern Earth Kingdom city that is more dealing with trade with the Northern Water Tribe. There's Jondari, which is the sort of, it's, it's again, in between Earth Kingdom and Fire Nation, so it's your Fire Nation in Shang City. There's Port Tugak, which is your sort of so- Southern Water Tribe, Shang City. 
And then the more mysterious one, Taku, which seems to just be a kind of general, more middle of the Earth Kingdom city that we don't know too much about. Um, we find out that these cities exist because of this event from the past called the Platinum Affair, which has sort of shaped uh, sort of uh, international relations over the last couple of years. And interestingly, it only happened eight years ago from the present story. So it's still in everyone's mind, which is quite kind of nice. It's not ancient history. It's only recently happened. Um, we find out that the, the leaders of these Shang cities are known as Zongdus and that they were initially given these roles because they were from trusted noble families but we we slowly find out that most of the zongdus are just out to make money for themselves and so even though they're in pseudo world leadership positions they are not actually good leaders in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and so the actual plot of the book occurs because yang chen goes to bin er just trying to improve things for in Ur and the other Shang cities of like the people are beginning to rise up and feel that things aren't going their way you as the leaders should step in and do something and effectively Yang Chen just mentioning the Earth King and what happened in the Platinum Affair causes this kind of chain reaction of things to happen where they instead of just trying to be better leaders and putting the work in decide to go for this like nuclear option of bringing in this weapon that's like the mystery of the entire book. Yang Chen spies on them and overhears about this. And so the entire plot of the book is a basically is basically what is the weapon? Intercept the weapon before they get it. Oh no, they have the weapon. Stop the weapon. And and again, like I said, it's it, it's that plot of a normal incident an avatar will be dealing with turning into more of an international incident. And I really liked how this overall worked. I thought just like the Dao Fei was really cool for like an era defining concept the Shang cities is a very cool and well explained concept in my opinion but what were your thoughts on the on the Shang cities the merchants and and so on the the main plot of the book yeah no i think it definitely fits in terms of you know a sort of localized ish you know localized just meaning this time period not that it's really local because it's around the whole world that this incident or that these cities are actually involved with but it's sort of you know it's a contained idea here of you know a specific incident that one avatar is going to have to deal with in their potential you know lifetime here and you know it doesn't seem at least as far as we can tell which who knows maybe in future properties um now we'll get you know more of a reference to the platinum affair but as of now we know that this isn't something that you know crosses over towards you know the other avatar generations other than probably some of the sort of echo effects of whatever yang chen has to actually do you know by the end of the second book or however they want to tell the whole story um so no, i think the idea of these cities it fits within sort of the idea of you know political structures that the world would actually have to deal with is sort of you know also fits in sort of the idea of that there are some cities in the avatar world that have their own essentially like their own autonomy yeah. like they're you know almost run pseudo independent from other places even though you know they make it clear in this story um especially with you know what uh, yang chen tries to get over on the shangs in this particular city in ben Ur, um that you know they're not completely on their own they do still they do still have you know their own masters that they have to respond to since there are you know various restrictions that are placed on them so that they you know can't essentially be you know full powers on their own so no, i think the idea of them being the main sort of crux and that you know you can see that maybe depending on how yang chen might have dealt with you know the shangs in this city maybe you know things wouldn't have gone as poorly but this is you know sort of the whole idea of you know the avatar world in general is just you know the avatars have to deal with different things and their reactions and what they do have consequences for their actions and this is one case where we're seeing Yan Chen has to deal with this directly in the best way that they you know know how to as an avatar and we get to see their story play out through this mm -hmm. and the other interesting thing about these is like like you say they're sort of framed as like autonomous cities where even though they're more connected to a specific nation, they are more or less allowed to be run 
somewhat independent of like the fire lord the earth king the high chief of the northern water tribe um in that the only involvement from them seems to be that once you give us a cut of like the the taxes the customs from the the trade that's coming in you do your thing because the nations don't want to interact with each other so that's why these you know autonomous trading cities even exist in the first place but because they are kind of pseudo nations of nations we do get this sort of like early proto republic city sense to them in that you know in bin ur mm -hmm. for instance it's like Earth Kingdom slash Northern Water Tribe. In John Dury, we see that, okay, it's Fire Nation, Earth Kingdom, but there's also a bit of Water Tribe in there as well, right in the middle of the world. Um, and it's noted that that place specifically is very, very cosmopolitan and that even though it's like the furthest away from either Water Tribe, they still import Water Tribe food in there. Uh, what are your thoughts on, on this concept coming up like in this era, quite a bit before republic city you, you almost get this sense where like if yanchen succeeds we have four republic cities before republic city yeah no i i think that's a really cool concept here i mean the whole idea and they say it like um the the middlers and stuff like that how they actually sort of you know classify themselves or some of the people um do um is you know it is pretty intriguing that this is essentially like you said like a a proto republic city in the way that they're developing and you know in these sort of you know uh cities that they have here they really, you know, for the most part, and it's clearly it's not perfect, but, you know, the people are able to, you know, sort of because they're almost isolated and the people can't get out, as we learned, you know, they're forced to actually deal with people of other nations. And, you know, for the most part, they get along, you know, rather well with each other. Now, there's still issues with them dealing with the Shangs, which maybe that's why they're so willing to work together is because they have this sort of overbearing force put down on them that's sort of keeping them in place. and you know all hands on deck in order to sort of fight the powers that be um but you know for the most part it seems like these are really sort of like your typical cosmopolitan sort of like you know up and coming cities despite you know the rights and everything that's going on um where they have this you know their own sort of mindset that they actually you know it's really sort of like your your city mindset like i think there is you no know, there's a part where you know kavik suggested something to yang chen in terms of like how they're doing like their irrigation and you know they make note that that's like a very sort of like city you know idea type of thing of you know way of thinking um which you know the rest of the world outside of these specific cities doesn't really have that mentality towards yet um which is you know it's interesting to see um you know just sort of you know the blending of the nations together maybe that's working out towards the betterment and you know if the situation you know worked in the best case scenario maybe things might have been better you know later on which of course we know they didn't so clearly something happens that gets in the way of this um but you know it's interesting to see that this is something that could have been you know if things had turned out in the best case scenario we still don't know how it doesn't turn out that way but you know it's something to think of and maybe the remnants of this is actually sort of what helped some of those early nations um or those early cities that worked well together that we do learn about you know from the comics and stuff like that um this is maybe sort of the the groundwork of that yeah because the the cities obviously like three of them are completely new we don't know anything about them they may end up being like revealed to be maybe a location we do know about before but who knows like because you can look up some stuff especially from like the rpg game and there's like a few islands in the in the middle between the earth kingdom and the fire nation that are like hmm is this natsuo island maybe who knows um and like there's an incident like up north that's described in the rpg game is that maybe been er in that era taku is like the only place we actually know about because like i think the the nickelodeon website description of it describes it as being like an old trade port um and that's what he based this idea on so only one of these places still exists and it's obviously an abandoned trade port so we know eventually the shang cities sort of don't remain around and that they revert back to something because the interesting thing about this obviously is that these cities only exist because the three main nations refuse to deal with each other so if they ever do get back on good terms i guess the idea is that they just shut down the shang cities regardless of how 
good things are going and and that might be an interesting thing to see about what happens like that a good thing happening in terms of international politics could also mess things up for these cities just as much as bad things happening but anyway we'll move into some of the characters here and then get into the sort of like chapter by chapter you know making some points so yang chen of course uh, our main character here um we see we have a little bit of flashback stuff with her but for the most part she is 17 in this book has mastered all the elements this is set somewhat like a couple of months i guess after the events of the rift because that's still in her mind um and yeah we're just seeing her still somewhat early on in her avatar journey but she is very capable very competent uh, and there's a there's a few dynamics with her of course the obvious ones are the memories of jetson who we gradually learn over the course of the book it's slowly revealed she did die in some sort of spirit related incident we'll get to it as we go through the book so that weighs heavy on yang chen there's also the past avatars memories thing the the haunting of these past life memories and it's weird the way it plays out and that it's a quite a complicated thing in the first two chapters but then she mostly has control of it apart from relatively subtle moments in the rest of the book and then the main takeaway from her as an avatar you get is just this idea that she chooses very specifically to be an extremely active avatar uh, that she will not wait a lot of time for things to slowly work themselves out and get done she won't be reactive to bad things happening no she'll choose to strike before a wound even happens that's her philosophy as an avatar and we find out it's because she has all these past life connections and the main thing she learns from them is of course that all avatars wishes wish they were more active they have all these regrets so she tries to do things in a way where she doesn't have those same regrets that that's the the best way to be but it's a very you know time consuming a lot of effort has to go in to be that type of avatar and in this book we directly sort of see that a very simple thing she has all the advice she could possibly give them she will help them every step of the way they just refuse to interact with her and how does she like force them to kind of agree with her and so we we get this other aspect of like she is the avatar people expect her to be but there's this other side to her where she's yang chen the spy master who like employs errand runners and has spies and gets information on people and <laughs> and so on and so that's what she feels she has to do to make things happen that that to me made her a very interesting character because you see that she's not just the perfect yang chen that we know about she has moments of in intense frustration just as much as anyone because she hates how much effort everything takes to make happen but um that's a general overview of sort of yang chen and what she's like but uh what were your thoughts finally getting a, an in-depth exploration of uh, yang chen as a character yeah no i think you make some good points there that it you know, we have this sort of surface level, you know, the appearance, the sort of portrait version that they mentioned in the book of Yang Chen and how people view her. And then we have, you know, this other side to her character where, you know, she's trying to actively as best as she can, you know, shape the world towards a better, you know, a better place. And, you know, these are often at ends and at conflict, you know, with the outside world and with her internally and her upbringing and, you know, her trying to figure out how to deal with this with, you know, all the knowledge that she has, her, her connections to the past, um, you know, and doing those in sort of the, the best possible way of, you know, trying to quell things before they actually happen since from her perspective that's you know going to be the best way to actually deal with things and you know this is something where she might not necessarily have you know the best sort of you know route for doing things um but you no know, this is what she's going to be sort of laying down as her potential legacy as an avatar um even if a lot of what she's doing might not necessarily be known to the public at large mm -hmm. um 
yeah, yeah, because the, the early chapters, I think we can get into the past Avatar memory stuff because that's most of where it is. So we will move on for now to uh, Kavik. He is our secondary main character, but interestingly, he is he's not really written like, say, Rangi is, where, like, if you go back to the first two Kyoshi books, you realize that, like, Rangi doesn't get, like, that much character focus. She benefits from obviously being around Kyoshi for a lot of those books, but you don't really get chapters, like, entirely from her perspective and stuff like that. Kavik kind of gets to be, like, in or around half of the book, especially early on. Like, you, you almost spend more time with him than you do with Yang Chen. And I think it works out well for the book because, because in a way, like, the Yang Chen stuff, they're keeping a lot of the, in a way, like, personal character plot with her, I think, probably for the next book. I think it made sense to introduce the completely new character and give him a lot of time, but also actually have somewhat of a similar dynamic to Yang Chen of like, okay, he is our sort of person living in Bin Er, but he grew up in the Northern Water Tribe. His family came down here after the hunts started to go bad, but now things have started to go bad in Bin Er and they would like to return to the North but they can't because one of the things with the, the Shang cities is that it is very difficult to get passes out of the city. And in the same way, Yang Chen has these things in her past, like the past life memories and then what happened to Jetson. Kavik has this thing with his brother, Kalyan, that he kind of looks up to him as a hero. He greatly respects him. At the start of the book, he's trying to like find him and bring him back. I suppose, gains information that maybe suggests that Kalyan left on purpose and in a way chose not to come back and that like alters how he views what is what he's sort of made into his life goal. And so you see this idea of like the, the character is kind of defined in a way by like he always compares himself to his brother who is better than him in like every way. And Kavik views him as being Kavik the Lesser, Kalyan the Great, and this contrast between the character that we see, like, say, around Yang Chen, who shows so much potential to be an amazing Avatar companion, but then almost this self-destructive side of himself when it comes to, like, his past and blaming, blaming himself for things. And so the idea of him sort of, like, lying and how good of a liar he is and it comes up a lot with regards to the, the Yang chen Kavik dynamic... Um, that she views that as being a good skill to have as an errand runner, but it also kind of goes against the true friendship that is beginning to form there. And obviously key events in the book happens where this comes to the forefront and he makes sort of the, the wrong decision ultimately. But I came out of this book really, really liking Kavik as a character. I, I, I Like I said, appreciate that they gave him a large amount of the book and... Um, and it worked having these two main characters. But what were your thoughts on Kavik? Yeah, I think for me personally, I didn't. It didn't irk me at all that you know this new character was getting, I guess, sort of the, the forefront of you know various chapters or parts of chapters. Um, because I think, you know, like you said, it, it is important to establish him as a character. And it seems like, you know, as far as we know, he's going to be, you know, one of the main, you know, characters throughout the whole series and potentially, you know, Yang Chen's companion, you know, despite, you know, sort of what happens at the end. Um, you know, I'm sure it'll take some route that, you know, will be, you know, interesting and intriguing for where the story actually goes. And, you no, know, I think the idea that they're trying to show that these two characters, Yang Chen and Kavik, are so similar, and, of course, they're close in age, you know, is just a, a comparison point to, you know, show, you know, the potential of what they can do together um, in the future, you know, regardless of what actually happens. Um, so for the most part, that actually worked. I think, you know, he has his own background. He has where he comes from, like you mentioned, and there's elements of that that you can see that play out. I and mean, you can also see his sort of transition into sort of the more city-like, you know, waterbender that we can see from other, you know, characters in the whole Avatar franchise that are more sort of like turned to be more sort of city focused. So there's the whole sort of like arc that he has in his character even before he's meeting Yang Chen. And, you know, it's also just, you know, with the way that the story 
you know, focuses so much on the whole idea of the Avatar companion and what that means, you know, to the world at large. Um, I think it makes sense that we're sort of getting a more in-depth characterization on one that has the potential to actually be this. Um, we do get to see a couple other ones, um, but, you know, they're also a little bit more along the lines of the, the older side of things. So it seems like when, you know, they do that stuff in these stories so far, they always, you know, try to keep some of the mainstay of the, the companions near-ish the age of the Avatar, you know, just for the sake of story and how, you know, that would probably work out in the real world as well. Um, so no, I think for the most part, Kavik, uh, the new waterbending character who also has a bit of a history despite being so young. Um, but of course he's very talented as well as the book mentions, you know, quite a few amount of times because your companions also have to be, you know, quite adept at whatever they do as well. Um, worked for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and I think the main thing you get here is that the, the two do kind of like, need each other like yang chan it, it definitely comes across like she needs to have like a a friend around her own age to travel around with because otherwise she it seems to just be around all these advisors or older characters who she usually isn't happy with the information that she's getting and you can see like especially the early chapters that we're going to go through here she seems to have a lot of fun like messing with kavik their banter is actually really really good and he has also, in a way, like needed a friend, as we find out. Like, he doesn't actually have many other friends, and um, so, um, that's a key part of it as well. Um, because we're only covering the first third of the book here, I, I think we'll leave it with just one more character before we jump into the chapters, and that is uh, Zongdu uh, Honshu. His is probably the most difficult name to pronounce in the entire book, because uh, initially, without the audiobook, I was saying Henshi, but it's like Honshu or something like that. <laughs> um, so <laughs> just understand, this is the Zongdu of Bin-Ur. Uh, he is our, he, he's basically our villain for the book, even though there's some other characters who are probably like well above him, but he's the one who causes a lot of what happens to actually happen here. Now, I actually like him. I, uh, he is not the best villain in Avatar, but I think he plays his role very nicely in this book as just, he wants to be your typical Zongdu. He wants to get in, make his money and get out and you feel for him just a little bit because it is a situation where everything goes wrong on his watch and he doesn't get to get the benefits of this position that in his mind he works so hard to get pay for or whatever and um, he has one very very clever move that is a very cool plot point in the in the book that basically gets him the unanimity and it's just this sense where instead of choosing to just be a better leader, he in his mind takes the easy way out, which ends up being implementing this desperation plan without fully pl you know, thinking it through. And that's what you know loses him this game, this political game. And it's why he's in the position he's in at the end of this book. But I thought it was good of just... Um, a bit of a political threat here, but not a mastermind. Uh, just someone who is in a just powerful enough of a position to be dangerous. And that's the plot of this book. I, I thought it worked, but I think we will be into stronger villains, more focus in the next book. But what were your thoughts on uh, Zongdu Hunsha? Yeah, for... Um... For him, I think it's he feels almost along the lines, if we're having to compare it uh, to other ones, you know, maybe along the lines of like a long fade type of character, because he, he definitely has, you know, the potential and the ideas and the machinations and sort of like the plot to like push things forward. And, you know, he has a, a clear idea mostly of, you know, the sort of status of things in the world and you know he he was able to build himself up from you know from what we understand like a relatively low position using you know various dealings as is known in the shang cities to you know essentially become to you know the highest position that you can have in the city now he's still at this high position but he still has masters of his own that he has to sort of answer to but you know that's sort of like the push and pull of the position that he's in here and like you said if everything would have worked out 
best case scenario, he would have been in and out in, you know, what is it, five or eight years or whatever, and you know, would have been left alone to his own devices. But like you said, unfortunately, everything doesn't sort of quite go his way. And he tends, you know, which it seems like this is in along the lines of his character is he takes sort of like, you know, what potentially to him would be sort of the easy route out based off of how he got to his position in the first place. And from there, everything seems to fall apart. Um, but yeah, I think as sort of a, a lesser villain type character, if you want to consider him that, um, he plays his role pretty well. Like he, he has, you know, some skills that, you know, is able to sort of, you know, get around at least initially from, you know, what's being seen. Um, but he doesn't quite have, the full scope of things or hasn't looked at all the angles from everyone who's involved with his schemes because you know he he gets to a certain point and then things start to unravel even farther out of his grasp mm-hmm. and then i suppose one final thing i probably has to have to ask this because the book is so focused on it from a pretty early point um were you happy with what the reveal on unanimity turned out to be and um Throughout the book, I suppose, where were you at on like figuring out what it was? That's a good one. That that's a good one. I think I don't know when they when they mentioned what unanimity, you know, what it had the potential to be. You know, of course, I'm thinking sort of like what currently in the Avatar world would work, or what potential new things to could work and what would fit within sort of like the time period that we're in. Because um, there are, you know plenty of things that they could do or just, you know, make up. But, you know, if it's going to fit with something in the world, you know, what could work? And when they do finally sort of reveal and, you know, they sort of, you know, try to lead you astray with what it is, um, I don't know. I think I'm sort of like 50-50 on terms of, like, I like what happens and the results of it and sort of what it can mean for the future. But I don't know if I was, you know particularly keen on that being like the thing that actually sort of was the crux of his power or from his sort of like backup plan for things. I think I like the idea. I like the culture aspect and the world development that it actually brings to the things because, you know, it's one of those things that were sort of like, how did this come to be? How did he learn these techniques? How does, you know, how does one become one? Um, So I like where that comes into play, but I'm not sure from the initial onset, if that was something that I would have particularly keyed in on to, you know, considering even in the story what they mentioned sort of like as in like an apothecary sort of like drug or something like that or agent that could have been, you know, something along the lines that could have been the same sort of, I guess, power that they could have had over the Earth King and the other nations. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like uh, I was pretty happy with it. Like the thing with a mystery is that like when you get the answer, like you have to be like pretty happy with it. And I, I think I was very happy with it, just knowing that, okay, this means we're actually going to finally, like, explore this. Even if it's not in this book, Mm -hmm. it feels like the next book we are going to explore this. (laughs) And that will be very, very exciting when we get there. And I thought a good job was done about sort of, yeah, leading you astray a little bit of, like, it's this. It fits in three containers. Kavik is standing next to it and then, like, twisting it around and then... I, I, I figured it out before they like very directly told you what it was and it was just like the connections coming together and I was like yes that is brilliant um so I, I was very happy with it uh, when it came out but um yeah we'll, we'll, we'll get into the book now um we probably won't spend too much time on each chapter um but um you know we'll, we'll hit the key points uh, as we go on so um the first chapter of the book this is one of the preview chapters of course voices of the past we've actually talked about this one quite a bit so we won't spend too much time on it this is probably one where it's it's more interesting to discuss in reflection that this is the most in-depth they go into like yang chen's like affliction or gift in the entire book and in, it kind of is slightly misleading in that they, they actually give you some of the details here. We get a new avatar named Avatar Gun, but we just effectively find out that like, okay, this is why Yang Chen found out she was the avatar quite early on. And um, this is the, the other people at the temple, how they kind of look after Yang Chen during these incidents. And that basically 
this is what could potentially happen to Yang Chen at any point during the book if a memory is too intense. Um, so I, given that we've talked about it a lot already, um, I suppose, what are your thoughts on ultimately where this plot goes and how it's explored in the book? Uh, were you were you disappointed? Like I, I was definitely a little bit disappointed that ultimately this led to a lot of relatively vague scenes of like potential things that could happen to Yang Chen. And I liked the reflections on Yang Chen always needing to be aware of like, is this my memory or someone else's? But I, I think it would have been better to have more specific instances that these moments would have, I think, hit harder if she talks about, say, being claustrophobic in this one scene. And she knows that it was this avatar because this thing happened rather than just well, in all these avatars, one of them must have been claustrophobic. It just kind of takes a little bit away that it's more <laughs> mathematical rather than like a, a specific in instance. So the Avatar Goon example is very good, but then it's all very subtle after this point. To the point where it kind of feels like, apart from chapter 1, 2, and then chapter 30, which are all flashback chapters, it doesn't play that big of a role in the book and I'm, I'm i'm left just questioning a little bit what was the like aim of this as a plot point for the most part like i get it it is meant to be yang chen has to find her own way as the avatar because even though she has this gift that connects her more heavily with past avatars their advice can't solve her problems but i still think there's a little bit of like the, the writer, in a way, not wanting to give any other specifics on avatars. And that's kind of a lot of why this plays out the way it does. But what, what were your thoughts on how this plot worked over the rest of the book? Hmm. Yeah, I, I think I understand your point of, like, the potential of this ability and what it could actually mean in terms of the story is a lot more than how it was actually used. So and from that perspective, it's sort of like a, almost like a missed opportunity of what they could actually do in terms of like expanding the world and expanding, you know, what we currently know of the Avatar. And you no, know, if they don't do that is because of just sort of like the restrictions that they wanted to have on the story or restrictions that they wanted to have on the world or just because they just, you know, it would have been too much to sort of think of that. You know, those, those things sort of do factor into it. I think, I mean, you know, like you said, it is really a key thing that sort of is shaping her character and her sort of outlook which I think you know all the avatars to some degree have to learn that she just has to learn that more directly because it can actually really affect her physically in the current time the current characters and there is you know at least one good moment where they do mention you know how it doesn't really matter and that's sort of like what she has to do and figure out on its own um but yeah i think it would have been nice to have like a couple more incidents where you could actually see you know it's name thing and i don't know maybe that's just because you know we're fans of the show and everything in the world that we sort of see that that would be a real like plus to actually have it as a, a character trait and everything but i don't know i think it also you know has some merit as in terms of just like this isn't the story of past avatars. Mm -hmm. This is the story of Yen Chen and what she has to do in this time. So, you know, we shouldn't potentially dwell on those directly. Although I do think that, you know, when that does happen, it wouldn't be like the worst thing ever to say, you know, this avatar 400 years ago, you know, not in these direct you know, words or anything like that, but like, you know, that they are the one that had this issue and that there was some history. Because like you said, when they do mention like, they have to go to the tomes in the library and sort of, you know, figure out where this is or where this, you know, person that was related to a past avatar place in history, you know, that does come out pretty cool. And at least in this current time, they have the means to figure it out. Like there's chronicles in history. Now, of course, we know that everything gets destroyed later on. So in the larger scheme of things, it doesn't quite matter as much. Um, but currently they do have the potential for that and you know something like that it seems like it it works to help 
her as a character as in sort of like to get her down from whatever ledge she might be on because of the past history um so in that case it seems like it wouldn't be the worst thing to include it just for the fact that it'll help out yang chen um mm-hmm. so there definitely is you know some positive they could have had to actually including it a little bit more if they wanted to yeah because like one of my favorite moments is much later on in the book when she's talking to a unirak and she kind of like says like this is this is why this doesn't work. Like I, I felt the shame of Avatar's past. It would have been nice to get like examples of that to show very, very clearly why Yang Chen takes this somewhat unique path as an Avatar, because you know this Avatar in a way fell to this particular fear or this weakness, um, and that she feels she has to avoid all of them like at all costs that's why she especially at the start of the book is very like you know whenever someone mentions like zito she's just like oh you're 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 mentioning him that i'm not as good as him and you have that like arc over the book as she comes to realize now i can use that to my advantage but it it would have been nice to get just a few other references because obviously you don't want the book to be bogged down like every chapter she's mentioning the events of like a a previous new avatar that we never knew about before but in in the same way that ultimately like to escape from the spirit world which uh, fce has mentioned multiple times is the source of a lot of what he bases the you know the the books on like if, if in a way if they those web shorts didn't exist he might have not been able to write these books that sort of thing that works because it's ang learning about you know what it is to fail as an avatar by getting actual detailed examples of other avatars failing so you understand in comparison to karok you know kiyoshi roku what ang's failure is like and up against and i think they try to do that here but they have to rely on a lot of just like vague moments of like an avatar in the past must have been dishonored as a fire avatar and that's why she feels like revulsion when she sees all the top knots cut off or something like that whereas like would it have really been a problem to just mention the name of a fire avatar past who had a dishonored moment um but we'll we'll, we'll move on and uh, that's that first chapter the the second chapter is a quite quick one where it's like three years later when she's 11 so it's uh, yang chen and jetson meditate into the spirit world and it's a big proof for Yang Chen that her powers work normally, and it it is just this past avatar connection that is the thing. It's still she can still go into the spirit world, um, and it seems like everything is fine. She's really happy. It gets across that Jetson is this really really important person to Yang Chen. Now the big thing, and I think we talked about this before, is that there's likely more to this chapter. Turns out there is. Chapter 30 is a direct follow-up to this, um, and I think it's sort of important to talk about it a little bit now, of that this is ultimately this tragic moment, that that chapter reveals that as this event goes on in the spirit world, they come across spirits, spirits that we actually see in Legend of Korra, and Yang Chen just freezes, not because she's afraid, but because a past avatar was very, very afraid of the spirits in the spirit world. And this creates this situation where her fear affects the spirit world, turns the spirits dark, and Jetson is is forced to sort of, in a way, sacrifice herself to save Yang Chen. And so we get this idea of Jetson dies, her spirit is trapped in the spirit world, um, and this is something that Yang Chen is like... the The main effect of the past life memories on her is that they led to the death of Jetson which doesn't really get resolved. It gets explored a little bit in this book in terms of what happens, but that feels like it will be a book two thing. And so there's a general sense that this overall plot from the first two chapters is more of a book two plot. But um, what were your thoughts on that? Um, Just from chapter two, did you think that there would be a second part to this? And how happy were you when they actually came back to it and it had an importance to the plot? 
Yeah, no, I thought that was really good. That that had an important part. I mean, you know, ending with the spirit world is always interesting, but the fact that this is sort of one of the more involved parts, because you know, we were you know mentioning sort of like the idea before of like you know, what do you do when you're in the spirit world? How does that actually affect things? And then we see here that you know, it isn't always as perfect as you know we were first sort of led to believe, and that there is a bigger story to it. And it also looks like there will be some sort of you know closing plot point to this whole you know sort of you know incident that happened with Jetson from right here in the beginning and you know like you said this is one of the more sort of character defining sort of points for Yang Chen and this was you know really early on in her life that you know she had this happen to her so it definitely is one of those sort of like shaping character moments that you know you can see you know trickle down of how it affected her later on in life so no i thought this was a really good one to sort of establish this and then when you actually get to see sort of what the story was behind it because it you know right here it seems like this is almost like you know ideal mm -hmm. sort of spirit world journey but it, it isn't quite that way mm -hmm. um the third chapter is called Voices of the Present, not the Past. And this is the first Kavik chapter in the book. And so we obviously get introduced to Bin Ur here from his perspective. We see that we get the explanation of, you know, things starting to go wrong in Bin Ur. There's a riot about to go down in like the international quarter of the city. Um, one of these Shangs called uh, Tain, um has obviously uh, done some stuff that's wrong that uh, the, the people have an issue with. You learn about what he did later on. And so they're kind of outside this shrine that he's about to come out of. And as Kavik walks by, it's revealed that like the, 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 the other people are like, yeah, we hired an errand runner to, to get the information, which is why we finally pinned him down. He'll have to talk to <laughs> us about uh, what he did to us. He cheated us. Um, and Kavik just basically walks away and it's kind of like, oh, yeah, that that was me. I was the errand runner that was hired to get that information. So he heads off and. Um, we see his new job is that he has to go to this uh, ice hotel, basically, called the Blue Manse. And he is tasked with going up to one of the rooms and stealing any important information he can get from that room. He doesn't know what it is, but um, he heads up there. It's a pretty cool action scene. Like He water bends into the wall and slowly climbs his way up here. Uh, there's a big time limit here on sort of like frostbite that he, would, he could die from the cold. Um, and he gets across that like he is a skilled, but he's not this like powerhouse prodigy bender. So he, he it takes a lot of time and effort to, to, to get what he wants done here. So he makes his way into the room and looks through the documents. And then right as he's about to leave the door, who comes in the door but Yang Chen. And this is the kind of surprise moment. This is the way things are going to go for Kavik for these first couple of chapters is that Yang Chen is just going to walk in at inopportune moments and really troll Kavik here as like she you know gets involved in his life so lots of stuff in this opening chapter that are quite nice even little details like you find out that like the earth king how like how devastating he can be like throwing people up on the walls and stuff like that he's purging traitors from his court that that is a threat ultimately to this um and yeah, just the, the tensions in Bin Ur. This is why Yang Chen's here in the first place. So uh, what were your thoughts on this uh, opening Kavik chapter? Yeah, I thought, I seeing, you know, how they're sort of, I think this was probably when you fairly sort of get the idea of how sort of the story's going to go in terms of like how they're sort of using, I guess, sort of some of the abilities and sort of how... They're trying to use sort of the techniques that they have um, here. And just, you know, Kavik as a character, this is a good introduction towards his style of doing things, how he views the city, how the world is currently being viewed. Um, just the whole idea with, like, the Earth King and sort of his court. Like, that's a pretty, the way to describe it, it sounds, you know, pretty bloody what's actually, like, going down there. And the fact that, you know, we're starting here with the potential for, like, a huge riot and they're trying to sort of confront a Shang directly that they had to use some backhanded ways in order to actually, you know, get him into a location where they could actually meet him um, really just sets the stage of the current sort of, I guess, turmoil that's going on in the city and, you know, maybe the, the world at large overall um, with the whole idea of the Platinum Affair. Um, but no, I think the sequence is pretty cool. I like, you know, 
the way that they break down how Kevik has to sort of go up the sort of inside wall of this hotel um, it's pretty, you know, it's pretty interesting. I don't think I quite got exactly what was going on the first time I was looking at it, but it's, I don't know, it feels like it's a bit more to, sort of like unique in terms of what they're doing. Cause you know, of course, as a water better, like, you know, and they mentioned this, I think in the next chapter, like he could just, you know, bring the whole thing down if he really wanted to, but that's not his goal here. And they also make the point of him not being like a monster or anything like that. So it's pretty cool to see the technique here of how you know, he actually goes about this and how there really is sort of like a limit to disability because if he did it like you know quite the wrong way he could you know basically get frostbitten and you know die from that sort of situation which almost is what happens later on um so no i think there's it's interesting how there's like set limits and set controls in this sense i don't know sometimes when you think of avatar and the abilities that they have beside you know the fact that you know there is like of finite, you know, exhaustion and energy limit that it almost seems like sort of like without limit, depending on the skill of the actual vendor. So no, I think this worked out pretty well. Yeah, because this is where we get the uh, Kavik the Lesser, Kalyan the Great comment. And at this point, like, you've no idea who Kalyan is. It's not said that that's his brother, but you, on a second reading, realize, that, oh, he mentions him here. And I think the context in which he mentions him is that, like, Kavik says that, like, he has to melt the upper part of the wall and then use the water that runs down to like increase his platform. And that's how he like goes up the wall. But he sort of says that someone like Kalyan could just like phase up through the wall in this like flowing motion of just, he is constantly melting and that's becoming the platform. Whereas I think Kavik says that he has to do it in like six, six inch like increments basically. So he has to like, a very set order it's not as flowing as like a a master bender like his brother so that's kind of cool uh the other thing of course is that tain comes out doesn't speak to the crowd and just sends thugs in to attack the crowd like that's how they deal with problems here the, the shangs the, the leaders of bin Ur, and that's part of the problem of like they don't want to and don't really know how to actually fix things for the people and make things better so and um, that that's a key point as well. Chapter four is called Flight. Very short chapter. It's just like three pages. It's basically um, Kavik tries to escape. Um, he grabs a letter, basically falls through the floor using water bending, but his feet get trapped kind of randomly, and then he gets captured after a little bit of an action scene. Yang Chen arrives in and is like, "Don't harm him. Bring him downstairs." I'll talk to him in a few minutes and it's just like Kavik nearly got away but didn't later on it's revealed that Yang Chen was the one who sort of like froze him in the floor and that fundamentally he would have gotten away if Yang Chen wasn't there so um, this is why she's impressed by him and actually seems to want to talk to him so a little bit of an action showing that uh, I think this is where we get the reveal that his his style is sort of like a wrestler so he tries to go low and sort of knock people over rather than just aiming for the face like most people would. So um, he's a little bit more subtle and careful in, in his approach. So your, your thoughts on this um, escape sequence here? Yeah, he definitely does have, I guess, somewhat a different style of waterbender, at least from what we're, you know, sort of making a point of mentioning here, which I don't know, I think that's, it's cool that he has his own sort of way of doing things because it makes him stand out from what we've seen. But yeah, no, I think overall this, this, I guess, sort of escape or attempted escape scene um, works well. I mean, this is like your typical sort of thing. Like you, you break into some place and then things go haywire and you have to try to figure out how to get out, you know, in front of all the different people. And like you said, like if it wasn't for, you know, Avatar Yang Chen sort of stepping in, it seems like he ha would have gotten away pretty quickly. And even him himself doesn't realize what was the force that pulled him back um, because it seems like, as in with like most people and things like this and you know this will come up later on when we're talking about it the whole sort of like air element aspect of how to sort of like counter it is something that you know people just don't get until they have to confront with it directly which considering how you know the air nomads are somewhat isolated ish or at least in terms of like dealing directly with people it kind of makes sense that even even in this time period people still aren't sort of like 100% like 
aware of what they can do, what their abilities are. Um, I mean, I think this comes out, you know, particularly keen later on in the later chapters when they're sort of fighting with unanimity, um, you know, sort of like what the technique that Yang Chen is using in order to do things. So, no, I think that that part works here pretty well and, you know, does... You know, Kavik is still pretty cool with how he almost gets away from things. Yeah, like it is a good point in that, like you realize that, oh yeah, even when there are no air nomads around, like whoever from other nations trains with the air nomads to even know what they are capable of, who spars against air nomads in in, in fighting. So it is like an ultimately a very secretive, full on technique that really only I guess like the Avatar and then a couple of like the best masters in the world who might like research it would know about. So it's, it's this point that we say like, Oh, in like say ATLA that uh, because the airbenders haven't been around for a hundred years, no one knows how to fight them. But I think the point is more that even if they were around more recently, they probably still wouldn't know how to fight them because when would you be fighting an airbender <laughs> is kind of the point. Cause otherwise like, yeah. they are viewed as being like, if there's even one air nomad in your city, like, they can bring peace to that city type thing. So no one's attacking them randomly as well. Um, next chapter um, is called uh, Forgiveness, I believe. Um, and in this chapter, mm -hmm. um, we see that uh, <laughs> the guards ignore Yang Chen. They beat Kavik, but she just arrives in and is just like, yep, yeah, your guys are fired. I told you not to do this. Go down to Boma, uh, tell him that you're, you're done. Uh, and then she speaks with Kavik. She she heals him to make sure he doesn't get frostbite. So it's revealed that she has water bending healing. And um, they cover a few things like Yang Chen gets some information about like, oh, so y you're confirming it here that Bin Er is known as this city of spies and errand runners and Kavik is one of them. Uh, he does reveal here that he's independent. He doesn't work for any of the Shang merchants. Uh, he just works for other people. Um, and we basically just settle on this idea that right now Yang Chen just decides, OK, I'm going to give you some money. She asks him like a few questions like, do you live on your own? He's like, yeah, um, you don't have any family. So you do this to survive. So she gives him money from her diplomatic expense budget to um, basically just sort of keep him off the streets for a while. And he might be able to get back on the sort of straight and narrow. And they more or less say goodbye to each other in this way, because I suppose fundamentally, Kavik didn't take anything, even though we know he took a letter. Um, he didn't hurt anyone, really. So, okay, Yang Chen's letting him away with this because she doesn't believe he's the worst person in the world here. But then we get a chapter cut, and when we come back, he arrives in the Water Tribe district, and it's just revealed that, oh, he's full-on lied to Yang Chen. He has a family. He lives in a relatively big house, <laughs> considering the area. And it's just like, hey, what's for dinner? Interestingly, though, it's not just this terrible thing if he lied to the Avatar. He does give, like, all of the money to Mama Ayunarak, who it's revealed runs this sort of, like, um, restaurant that gives out food to people who are struggling in the Water Tribe district. So it's this kind of weird contrast where, like, he's got this kind of good heart, but he just blatantly lied to Yang Chen for it, what, what right now doesn't really seem like any particular reason. But we sort of learn later is more that, like, his mission is very focused on a specific member of his family and he doesn't want her to get involved in that at all. So um, an interesting chapter for sure. But uh, what are your thoughts on this one? Yeah, a quick one here, but I think, I don't know, it sets the stage for their you know, beginnings of their relationship with each other, just in terms of how, at least at this current time, you know, she's able to sort of you know she's trusting him on face value of what he's actually saying even though we know that later on you know she wasn't quite you know leading it along this sort of way but you know you can see that at least from his perspective this is what you know most of the people in the city would do as sort of these errand runners spies um and you know this is how they sort of function in the city and you know she he also tells her a couple of other things that are currently happening in the city that she isn't quite aware of and you can see her lose a little bit of control showing that you know her perfect mask of like serenity isn't always in place at this time um but you know you can see that her heart still is in like the right place and she gives him the money and that you know she lets him go after healing him which i think is cool that you know 
she has sort of these healing abilities, which we know for you no know, all word benders, it isn't quite like sort of like an assumed thing that you actually have. Of course, most of the water benders that we come across that are you know pretty proficient, of course, have this ability. But it's still cool to see here, and the fact that it gets used later on as well um, with two of these characters. So it it's definitely it seems like they're making a point that this is probably one of the things that adds towards her sort of like legacy as sort of like one of the the better avatars you know throughout the annals of like history or whatever because she does go through this extra effort to actually like heal people directly she's really like face on sort of avatar as we see mentioned later on as well mm -hmm. um so next chapter is uh kavik is, talk is talking to his parents and they're kind of asking him like where has he been because uh, the lie going on is that he's not an errand runner to his parents he's been working at this tea shop so he tries to say that, like, oh, yeah, I was just at the tea shop. But they're like, eh, we asked him, and he said you hadn't been there for, like, weeks. So they've caught him in this lie. And this is where they finally kind of, in a way, reveal, we we pretty much know you're doing errand running. But, like, we're just worried about you. And there's this sort of sense of, like, this unspoken thing of, like, what happened to Kalyan? Like, the, the idea that he has a brother comes out here. And he's like... I'm doing this, I'm, I'm becoming an errand runner to try and get Kalyan back. Because it was just mentioned before that, like, if I tell you about all of this stuff, you might disappear as well. So there's this sense of, like, what's going on with the whole errand running stuff in the city? What happened to his brother? Um, but his parents do just care. They, they are worried about him because they don't want him to go missing. He's worried about, like, he wants to get his brother back. Whereas it feels like the parents are kind of like... They like Kalyan back, but if it if it puts Kavik at risk, they don't want him to do it. So this big family drama is interrupted by a knock at the door. They open the door, and it's Yang Chen. So she she basically has sort of followed him back, um, has sort of seen through the lie a little bit, but um, it's a big sort of like troll moment as like Kavik begins to sweat as like she's turned up again in his life. Uh, <laughs> just after she's he's met her for the first time so i like this chapter a lot um I, I like the dynamic with his parents and that you know they have this sort of tragedy of like whatever happened to kalyan and they they don't want the same thing to happen to kavik but kavik is very set on i want to get him back because he doesn't know what happens he looks up to his brother i think this is a really strong dynamic but uh your thoughts on this chapter yeah, I think the dynamic is pretty strong here. The fact that we have sort of like a family grouping, um, I think it adds a sort of a unique element to the story because a lot of times we see our sort of like main characters that are usually pretty younger sort of like on their own and dealing with things. So the fact that we do have sort of this family component to the story, it adds another level of, you know, I guess sort of complexity of things um and i think you know it sort of like works out in like the best case scenario when you know they actually interact with yang chen later on and you know what actually you know how kavik actually works with the avatar so it's sort of like you know it almost has like a an out sort of scenario here because it you know they're sort of like so for the avatar and everything but so the initial idea that there is this strife in the family that you know one brother has gone another brother is still there but the younger brother is trying to figure out things i mean granted it's not like you know the most sort of like unique sort of situation ever since we have seen some of it in sort of chorus time but you know for the most part you know it's a, a proven story trope that tends to work pretty well and you know they do a couple different things with it and you know when we get to later on chapters they do even more different with it that i think for the most part for me um it works in terms of what they're trying to push forward with kavik's character mm -hmm. uh the next chapter the visitor obviously yang chen comes in uh, the, 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 his parents fall over themselves to, you know, do everything for Yang Chen. They're so happy, honored by this visit from the Avatar, um, and constantly she's just looking over the parents' shoulders at Kavik of just like, yeah, I'm here. You're in an awful situation. Who knows what I'm going to do? Um, but she starts talking to his parents and just is very polite. She gets sort of the family history story that they, they they come from the north. The when the the hunts started to go bad they came down to bin ur because this was this new thing that was starting up 
but now things are going bad here. They love to return to the north, but passes out of Bin Ur are very, very difficult to get. And she just gets a, a bit of more of a sense of what a normal, what what life is like for normal people in Bin Ur here, and that a lot of people would like to leave, but it's not made easy. Um, she then sort of transitions, of course, to like, oh, I'm here because of your son, and so what's she going to do here? But she starts a lie to basically give Kavik an explanation about how he in any way came into contact with the Avatar. And it's just this story about how, oh yeah, I got this uh, important document back for you. We didn't interact directly, but I didn't realize it was for the Avatar. But she's kind of saying like, your son has done like the world a great deed today. Um, can we talk alone? And they're like, sure, <laughs> go ahead. And when they're alone, she just reveals that uh, she needs someone in Bin Ur. He's an errand runner and she wants him in her pocket. Like, you work for me now, basically. That, that That's the kind of reveal here, that this is the sort of spy master Yang Chen beginning to come out, that she's she's hiring him here, basically. So um, very, very fun scene here. Again, the the dynamic knowing that she's making him sweat so much is, is very good. But uh, what are your thoughts on this scene? Yeah, I, I like the the idea of her just sort of like springing up here and sort of, you know, having to put him into a position where he has to sort of like cover these lies. And they go back and forth a couple of times here um, in front of the parents before they even get to sort of like the real proposition and everything. Um, just with him sort of like figuring out how he's trying to sort of deal with this. And you know, I think it's cool how they do some of the sort of like intro or intro, introspective sort of thoughts that Kavik's sort of having in terms of like going back and forth and how they're dealing with this. I think the story overall does a lot of that in terms of like what the characters are thinking, how they're going to deal with these situations, what the other side might think of. Um, it really plays up that sort of aspect of what they're sort of thinking and how things might go for them. So I think that was pretty cool here. And, you know, just the fact that she shows up to this family sort of like, you know, out of nowhere and sort of has this idea of like sort of like a visit of arms and just sort of, I don't know, I think it's interesting overall in the story how they're sort of putting up the culture of air nomads in general and how they're sort of being they're, you know still very sort of revered in this period of time um you know they really have sort of a a strong presence in the world and even later on when kevic does sort of get out of the city to see sort of where there are even more sort of air nomads all around um you know his initial thoughts of this is just you know what his parents do in this sort of situation where they sort of like fall over their heads over heels in order to sort of appease you know the air nomad or you know an avatar even more so uh, but you know i think the back and forth that yang chen and kavik have in this section um and the next chapter work pretty it's a pretty fun sort of back and forth here i mean it's nothing you know it's not like sort of the super seriousness of everything even though it does have you know strong ramifications later mm -hmm. on yeah there's a few nice moments uh, in that chapter like the the the, the father's like no just meet in the stew don't give it to her and the, the mother nearly dies thinking that she's like going to feed an air nomad meat and uh yang chen talking to kavik is like you're a rich kid it's like um it's like a fun moment and that like it directly points <laughs> out that like oh yeah it is notable that they live in like a two-story wooden house whereas everyone else lives in either ice huts in the winter or like sod huts uh in the summer but uh the next chapter is a direct continuation of this. So Yang Chen basically explains why she's chosen him. Because he, he's wondering, like, why me of all people? I'm not that good. And she just notes that um, she needs someone who's like an unknown, but who has good skills. And she does praise him for having good skills. This is where she reveals that you would have gotten away if I didn't, like, basically bend twice uh, to, to stop you from getting away. Um, but she needs someone in Bin Ur to give her good information because she kind of reveals as the Avatar, she's often misled by the people around her uh, and often has more or less spies in her retinue. Kavik refuses initially, but Yang Chen does reveal that, hey, it's not really that sort of a thing. You basically owe me for everything that's happened. And, and she's just kind of like, well, if that doesn't work for you, she just walks out to the parents and is like, 
I have a big offer here. Uh, Kavik has been so amazing. I've offered him a chance to become an Avatar companion. And the parents are like amazed by this. It's this incredible moment. The family has been changed forever. And Kavik realizes that like, ah, she's got me there. I, I can't, there's no way I can logically refuse this in front of my parents now that she's said that. So uh, he, she has completely forced his hand here. And so we get the, the first of a couple of like, you know, I hate you. And it's like, yeah, I know type moments of just highlighting that she's enjoying like torturing him a little bit, uh, having the advantage in these situations. So um, the banter is very, very strong here. And I think it's a good explanation from Yang Cheng because this is where we, we learn the idea of the struggles of being a public avatar and that the world focuses on her so much. That's why she needs people who are unknown to other people that they don't that they work for the avatar. That's the importance of all of this. She needs good information to make good things happen. But uh, what are your thoughts on uh, this chapter? Yeah, very, very informational focused the whole book overall and just uh, the Ben Ur city here. So Kavik with his set of skills and the fact that, like you said, he is sort of unknown, independent, not in necessarily the pocket of anyone, um, leads to him having this sort of favorable position that Yang Chen wishes to use here. And, you know, even if he is refusing, you know, she has sort of the, the upper hand in this situation because Kavik, you know, for all of his sort of like being on his own and independent, he still, you know, does have sort of like the core upbringing of being from, you know, a water bending from the Northern Water Tribe. So, you know, he still has his parents, he still has them and, you know, good respects and everything like that. He hasn't like completely gone on his own, like Kylon, his, um, his brother. So this is sort of like a hard situation for him to potentially say no in. Um, but, you know, she does at least give him a little bit of time to sort of think about it. But I think we can pretty much assume at this point that, you know, he's going to have to cave in some sort of way, um, even if, you know, before you get to the, the next set of chapters here. So, no, the, the banter is really good here. I think this definitely is just another good setting the stage for their character dynamic mm -hmm. here. Uh, next chapter, we cut to sort of like Yang Chen on her own. Interesting scene right when she wakes up. This is where we get the idea that she has to do these like um, mental exercises to make sure that like she keeps her own memories separate than past avatars. That um, you know, Abbas Dagmola has, has given her these exercises to do. She's maybe been stopping doing them a little bit too much recently, which is perhaps why some of these little things are bringing the memories to the surface again. Um, but it's it, it's an interesting thing to just that she every time she wakes up she has to be like, oh yeah this room, yeah okay yeah, yeah it's me <laughs> that it's it's a fun little moment um, not for her though uh, of course but um, then she's heading out to the parade so she just has to basically big public display avatar heading in to meet with the the leaders of the city and um, she's with Boma during all of this. And so she's on her, her bison, Nujian, and they're walking through the city. The people are, of course, angry and they see like a parade for like a celebrity basically as being a bad thing that they don't necessarily believe the Avatar will get anything done. So they're sort of angry at her as well. Stuff starts to be thrown. No one can hit her, but someone hits Boma and he starts to bleed. And Yang Chen loses it a little bit here. And like uh, Nujian uh, puts does like a tail slam at the crowd. Uh, she uh, throws something back at the crowd as well um, and it's just kind of like I'm here to help you and um, so it's just this this moment to get across that Yang Chen's sort of been a little you know perfect up to now but here's the sense that even she gets frustrated by things she she understands why the crowd is angry but and in, and in a way understands that until she gets something done they're not going to be like super happy about her being there um, but it's a frustration for her that like Boma has kind of suffered for, you know, basically poor leadership from the Shang merchants. So an interesting chapter overall, uh, a few interesting points here, but uh, what are your thoughts on uh, the parade here? Yeah, I mean, I really, I mean, I get that the, the city itself is trying to like put up this facade that, you know, 
they're not in like you know the worst situation that they actually are um but you know i'm sure in like the back of minds of everything like a parade through a city that just had a riot even if she technically isn't supposed to know that there was a riot it just seems like the worst case scenario for this sort of thing um you know even though you know i think they mentioned that you know they try to have like the more like better you know cleaner whatever people in the forefront but you know there's still people you know around the corners where you can see that you know this definitely isn't like the ideal situation for anyone to be around and it isn't until her sort of like advisor style is sort of like a way that you know everything sort of starts to come to pass here and you know she does mention that maybe if she kept the guards maybe they would have had a better sort of control the situation which was of course the reason why they were there in the first place but um you know that doesn't sort of come to pass here but yeah you definitely can see sort of like the mask of perfect sort of you know of the perfect sort of like avatar sort of like you know flicker here because you know and I don't know. It's just too bad because, you know, she understands the situation and it seems like initially, you know, they have the thought process that like if this, you know, sort of parade can give some positive, then she'll like suffer through it, even though, you know, she doesn't really want to do it per se. Um, But yeah, no, this is definitely sort of you just could see sort of the conflicting sort of like situations that are in the city along the lines of what, you know, Yang Chen is internally having Mm -hmm. to deal with. And uh, I suppose just because we maybe won't get too much of a chance to focus in on him in other chapters, uh, what was your takeaway on, I suppose, getting to pro- finally learn some stuff about uh, Boma, who obviously we, we, we knew from the, the Rift comics. We still <laughs> in this book don't learn too much about him other than that like he's an advisor for Yang Chen. She does consider him uh, her friend um, and just seems to be someone who is loyal to Yang Chen. He's made some sort of a like... You know, he promised the, the the Western Temple that he will look after her. Beyond that, you don't get too much about him. Like, there's a little bit later on where she alludes to the fact of, like, ooh, should she be, like, ever suspicious of Boma, just in case? Um, so what was your take on, on Boma, getting more about him? I mean, it was cool to see him in this. I mean, I think in general, I mean, you get to you know that he's here earlier on, but the fact that he, you know, he has this position, he's sort of always with the Avatar, I think it's, it's cool. I mean, it's sort of like a an older sort of companion that sort of has sort of like a mature sort of outlook on things, but still, you know, isn't necessarily like in the heat of everything that's sort of going on. But, you know, they make mention that, you know, he knows everything that she knows in terms of, like, what's going on and stuff like that. And he does, you know, he has a role that is sort of, like, there but not there. So, no, I think it's it's cool to have him there just in terms of, like, having another, you know, character that Yang Chen knows that can actually, like, you know, converse with to some degree. But I think because there's, like, the age difference there and sort of the more guardian role there, there is sort of, like, a distance there that, you know, probably needs to be filled by, say, a younger character such as Kavik. Mm-hmm. Uh, next chapter is kind of important uh, theater here. So this is the actual meeting, the kind of plot beginning to come into play here. So there's two big things in this. Um, she, we meet Zhang Du Hansha for the first time. Uh, he starts off with a history lesson and Yang Chen lets him give it. So this is where we learn about the Platinum Affair. So I'll go through this first and then we can talk about the what actually happens at the meeting. So the Platinum Affair, to explain it, happens eight years prior to the present day story. There's a rebellion in the Earth Kingdom led by a general named Nong. Um, we see that uh, this is this rebellion that's going on for a very long time, causing issues in the Earth Kingdom. The other nations are beginning to try, grow tired of this kind of constant conflict with the big nation. So they decide like, hmm, the, the, the high chief of the water tribe and the fire lord. They choose to actually side with Nong in this conflict, I guess, to try and gain more power. But not in a way that is so obvious that it immediately gives away their choosing sides. So what they do is they give paper banknotes to the Earth King, who they're not supporting fully. And then they give platinum as a currency to Nong. And it's described that this is much more valuable because it's it's more physical. It takes up less space. Uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, you know, it, it doesn't take up so much space. It's uh, just a more valuable thing in a small amount of space. Um, but at this point, the Earth King suddenly strikes and defeats Nong at a place called Lamapaka's Crossing. And in doing so, claims the platinum as well as the banknotes. He realizes what the the other world leaders were doing. 
So he immediately stops trade and communication with the other nations and he says that it won't resume until the platinum which he has used to plate his badger mole statue dulls. So basically a hundred years plus ongoing. Um, in response to this, the Fire Nation and the Water Tribes also stop trade and they've all become sort of isolated from one another, but they all still want the goods that the others offer. So they reluctantly agree to form this kind of deal that forms these Shang cities. And so this is why the Shang cities need to happen. They exist to facilitate trade between the nations who otherwise don't want to actually interact with each other. And this is why we have a situation now where the Fire Nation has no relationship with the Water Tribes or the Earth Kingdom and so on. The Air Nomads are sort of relatively free in all of this. They seem to be sort of like separate and have are able to do what they were able to do before the Platinum Affair. But it's a, it's a very cool incident that has uh, shaped the world here. Uh, what are your thoughts on this when we finally got the full details on the Platinum Affair? Yeah, this is pretty cool, I think. The fact that you know this one sort of incident within the sort of Earth Kingdom sort of sparked the world sort of conflict that they're now all having to deal with. And it's a relatively, you know, recent event that actually happened so i think like you mentioned earlier on that this is still pretty much in most people's minds like a lot of people could you know think of before this was actually like the way things was so the fact that this is so recent i think you know it makes it pretty sort of i guess intriguing that this is the current state of things and the fact that in theory this you know will last a lot longer um you know if everything went the way that it went which I'm sure things will change of course um but no i think this is i don't know it feels like it's a pretty i don't know maybe unique or just sort of a a cool situation in terms of just story wise uh, of how things are actually being done and there you know was something that actually came out with it because they do still you know they the leaders of the world they realize that there are certain things that either they just don't want to give up or that you know they can see the benefits of the other nations but they just don't want to deal directly with them mm -hmm. and it's interesting because like obviously um the main other thing with the Platinum Affair is like we learned that sort of two other kind of characters we meet in the book were actually sort of involved in this right in the middle of it without being like major players, which is kind of interesting. Um, but I do wonder, are we going to learn more about this ultimately? Um, it would be cool if there was like a reveal that there's there more to this mm -hmm. than meets the eye. Just because like uh, we do get to meet the Earth King later on. We find out Earth King uh, Faishan is... Uh, 28 year old eight years old currently meaning he was only 20 when this event happened and it seems to be this surprise like action that made him suddenly super stand out as a leader in the world uh, and it feels like okay how did he know that this is what was going on that he was being tricked what did he do to win the battle in one battle uh that seems kind of crazy to me because obviously they reveal like we have little bits and pieces he's mercurial he no one wants to mess with him you don't want to go against the earth king or he'll send his forces against you but he seems to be like a a good uh, you know, a strategist himself um so do you have any thoughts on that do you, do you think there's maybe more to this event than than meets the eye in terms of like i suppose the earth king as a as a world leader I wouldn't be surprised if there isn't more to it. I mean, it, it seems like, you know, the whole idea of, like, the spies in general in this story is, like, a, a mainstay at this point. But, you no, know, they make note that he has his own spies and that the other nations have their own spies as well. So I think they make note that he sort of knew that this was sort of going on even before it happened. So maybe that sort of led to the reason why he was so decisive in his actual strike um, towards the other group. And that sort of is sort of what led the whole world along the path that there currently is. But... No, they do make note of it later on that, you know, it doesn't seem like he's essentially like out the blood directly, as we've seen from some other potential Earth Kingdom leaders. Like he he has like a decent head on his shoulders, but he also doesn't, you know, take any sort of like back ended dealings from anyone else um, as well. You know, so he has this sort of like two sides of him that of the way that he actually acts towards like keeping the peace or keeping his people or his 
because you know anyone who's following him in line here so no i wouldn't be surprised if there isn't more to him i think you know since we do know that he does have you know direct interactions with yang chen um it should be something of note when there is sort of like more of a conflict directly between them and even with yang chen herself because i think you know it seems like that's where things are going to be leading towards later on in the story you know in the second mm-hmm. book and then yeah the the otherwise the meeting in this chapter is that basically yang chen tries to negotiate with them uh you know things are bad in the city uh i can help you I've done all this research, the reforms that were made in Omashu, I can help adjust them and make massive improvements to Bin Ur. It will improve things, you'll make more money. Like she's really getting it across that if you just help me to implement these ideas, things will go better for you. And she basically just gets like dismissed. They're like, Yeah, okay, we'll 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 think about it. Like we don't want to do anything right now. We'll we'll think about it. And she's kinda of like I will help you draft up these ideas if you don't know what to do, but they're kind of like, okay, you know, we were trying to be nice to you, but there's no spirit stuff here, you know. They really insult her over the idea of, like, mm, you actually believe spirits exist almost. Uh, and they just basically say, you have no power here, so we won't be dealing with you. That they just want to keep things the way they are. That they don't actually seem to care about improving things for the people like at all so um this is i suppose a a general idea of like i suppose you get the idea yang chen probably faces stuff like this happening constantly to her and this is why she takes the approach that she does in like coming chapters and has developed these tactics of like okay they'll always try and just shove me aside because they don't want to do anything right now but then I can spy on them and, and, and get an advantage. And that's what she's planning to do here. But right now, it really hasn't worked, even though she's offered them the perfect out. So, uh, and, and the interesting thing about this is that, like, Zhang Du Hanshu is introduced here, but it's more of the other Shanks that are the ones that are, are the ones that are, like, really, like, insulting her. He still doesn't really want to deal with her, but it's the other ones that really make the mistakes in this uh agreement but what what are your your thoughts on how the meeting goes yeah i mean he he definitely you know and they make note of this that he plays more the mediator type of role here but you know you, you definitely can see you know the power of you know this meeting and the city in general is from the people who are sort of making all the money and that would be you know the shang merchants and they're the ones you know that are sort of being in play here to sort of put in front of the avatar, especially the one that makes note of, you know, the fact that there's no spirits here, you have no power over, you know, the current situation of things, um, directly into, you know, the avatar's face here to even make, you know, the note of that, you know, maybe what she did before um, wasn't really, you know, a spirit. It was, you know, more of a typhoon that was actually you know, she had to deal with, which, you know, to me still sounds like a crazy thing that you have to deal with. But, you know, I guess they're, you know, since they have the idea that the Avatar isn't actually going to, like, you know, fight and destroy them in any way like that, that, you know, they'll, you know, have the one up on her in this sort of situation here. Um, But yeah, it definitely does feel like this is, like, a common thing that, you know, Yang Chen has to deal with, which is why she's developed these tactics that she's currently been using, um, but, you know, as of now and here at this point, she doesn't really have any sort of like upper hand in this situation. And, you know, this just stems from the whole beginning of this is just there's very little respect that they have for the Avatar in general, which is always one of those things that we're sort of talking about, like what, you know, what role or what position of power does the Avatar really have in the world um, overall? And, you know, this sort of, you know, leads you to the idea of why the avatar is such a reactive character in general it's just that you know they really don't have any you know direct way of saying this is what people should be doing because this is what i say Mm -hmm. because they're just sort of you know this all-powerful being which is powerful but they don't know 
their goal isn't, you know, to sort of be action and sort of, you know, take things head on most of the time because that's not what they're there for. And I'm sure, you know, an avatar could do that if they really wanted to. But, you know, that's the whole idea is that the avatar isn't for, you know, sort of the worst case there for peace and things like that. And especially with Yang Chen being an air nomad, that's even more so enforced there. Right. So it's sort of like doubly opposed on her as a character in terms of like being able to force things. And then I'm sure like her whole age probably factors in it as well. Like, you know, she does, you know, I think they make note of her, like being able to mention, you know, all of these old sort of wise idioms and stuff like that, um, which sort of like make her seem potentially more mature in different situations until she talks more plainly or anything like that. But no, at the end of the day, these other Shangs are, you know, older people who have been in these positions of power um, within the Shang city, at least for a period of time. And it even seems like, you know, some of them come from even more older, you know, power and money as well. So, of course, they're not really willing to give up their position in any sort of way. Yeah, because like we learn later on that um, you buy the position of like Zongdu, for instance. So the idea seems to be that being a high up Shang is sort of almost done in a very similar way. It's all about money, not about the people at all. So Yang Chen is in, in, to some extent like used to dealing with people who maybe not be the best leaders, but are actually world leaders and will be somewhat reasonable, but these people just are not. And, and um, one of the biggest examples of that is like Sadao, who's like part of her retinue, but is ultimately loyal to the Shangs is just like, in a way, a, a Zongdu is like an avatar and everyone's like, what? And the way it's explained, it like, it makes a lot of sense that like the positions are somewhat similar. Like um, you stay in a role that is not a role like just that you are born into necessarily. Like it's not through a lineage as such um, that you just take on this role for a certain period of time, do what you can, and it gets passed on to someone else. And in that sense, you know, they're, they're quite similar. But the book really gets across the idea that they couldn't be any further from that because one is just a position to gain money, whereas Yang Chen is actually trying to change things for people. So uh, that, that, that's an interesting kind of point there. But we move on to the next chapter um, where... Basically, Yang Chen feels like she's in a terrible position that it is correct. She doesn't really have any power in this position because she's just one person. As the Avatar, she relies on the respect of the Avatar getting kind of things done. But fundamentally, it has to be those people who make things happen. So after being so, you know, humiliated in a way here, she, she in a way resorts to something she doesn't really want to have to do. And that's where she brings up the idea of, like, the Earth King doesn't like to be cheated. I've been monitoring this port for a month. I know you've basically let through double the amount of um, shipments you're meant to allow through. And I don't believe you've actually been giving that extra money to the Earth King. How do you think he'll feel that you've been basically taking all this potential money from him? And she just leaves it there and she kind of leaves the, the room stunned by this like statement that they realize that they need to act upon this now. They're like, what, what have we done um, in a way that she really has hit the nuclear button here, uh, bringing the Earth King potentially into play. Like this scares the Shang merchants and you realize that they're comfortable in their position, but ultimately they are under all of the other world leaders. That they exist here basically just because the other nations are not in a good relationship with each other. Um, and that they don't want to have to deal with any of those world leaders. So it, it's in a way a clever ploy by Yang Chen. But she also doesn't like that she has had to sort of like add fuel to the fire to get leverage in this encounter. So um, an interesting scene as we see Yang Chen use a little bit of a desperation move. But um an interesting one to see that even just the name of the Earth King is enough to scare people. What are your thoughts on this chapter? Yeah, no, I think, I mean, considering what's happened and wider even in this situation, I think it makes sense that they're afraid of the Earth King. And, you know, they, we learn eventually that 
the city doesn't really have any of its own sort of forces. Like that's mm-hmm. sort of like part of the agreement of why they're able to do what they do. So they really don't have any action towards the Earth King. I mean, he could just come in or any essentially world leader, you know, or world you know, leader of a nation, if they want to cross the borders or whatever, could come over and sort of like set things the way that they should be. Um, so no, I think it makes sense that they're sort of afraid of this sort of situation, which is of course why they're willing to let, you know, uh, Henshe do what he actually eventually does here. But no, I think, I don't know, you know, Yang Chen, they mentioned this like pretty soon that this isn't necessarily the best way about going about things, but it's one way that could potentially work in terms of getting what she wants here. But you can see that everyone on both sides just isn't willing at all to sort of budge on what's currently happening here. I mean, this really is sort of like sort of like an early last ditch effort to sort of get what she thinks is the best way about going things. Mm-hmm. Uh, next chapter is fallback plans. And so we do get the idea that she kind of realizes, oh, this might have been a mistake because she has effectively provoked them. And she's in a way trusting that they'll respond to that provocation by backing down and being better leaders. But it's in a way like she, she it's almost the, the mistake that she makes is that she she trusts them too much to be world leaders when they don't want to be that like at all. Um, mm-hmm. There is a little bit of a one-on-one between Hansha and uh, Yang Chen, where like um, she just knows, like, I regret delivering the information the way I did, but I don't regret the contents of it. That your people are extremely entitled, like that you're you're justifying trying to like squeeze the people like this. Um, he does say like um, it's their right to look out for themselves and their families, but she just says family isn't an excuse to trample upon others. And he does say like I will try to convince them, but it's. It's definitely just that sense of like, we'll think about it. We'll meditate upon your wisdom avatar. And she's again sort of like brushed aside and all of this. Um, so we then have a scene afterwards where she basically is like, okay, Boma, uh, spy plan. And he like hides basically her as she like disappears into the streets. And so to everyone, it just looks like she's disappeared. This is her plan to go and spy on the one-on-one meeting with the Shangs. And so she uh, gets into the underground, like a heated floor system under the meeting hall. And there is a little bit of an uh, kind of like past avatar fear moment here where we get the idea that she feels a bit claustrophobic, but it's not her feeling that it's a past avatar feeling that. And what she has to do to sort of snap herself out of this panic attack basically is to remember like important events from recent times. And it's like, Oh, I'm Yang Chen. Only Yang Chen has met Kavik. And it's kind of like, there's a real focus on the idea that Kavik is her remembering that. And also Jetson, the the memories of Jetson. Those are the two things that kind of like bring her back in this moment. A little bit of a bending scene here. Like she sort of fires herself like an arrow throughout the heating system to get to where she needs to as quickly as possible. With the idea that the chapter just ends at a point where... um, she's in position ready to listen to what they have to say to each other with her not around and um, there's, there's some slight discussion about the idea of like boma is is a bit upset that she has to do more spy work as the avatar and she considers that the whole time herself of like you know did other avatars have to do things like this you know spy on meetings and the heated floors of uh, meeting halls but um this is what needs to be done and it works out for her very well over the course of this book but uh what are your thoughts on uh this chapter yeah the the spy master here i think i, don't, I like the idea that you know an avatar doesn't always you know they can't always be sort of the the public facing sort of character that they have to be like sometimes as they mentioned in this one they have to get a bit dirty in order to get the information or to find out what you know what is truly going on and yeah like you said it it does work out for her benefit here because she would definitely have been really in the dark like the story would take a huge turn if she didn't know the information that she eventually learns from this meeting here. So I think it definitely was sort of work here. And I like how this sort of ties back to the earlier sort of documents that she had in terms of like understanding the floor plan of this area so that she can actually get through the heated vent system that they don't use for whatever reason, but it's like the perfect way of her 
you know, getting through and spying on the different situations here. And yeah, this is another one of those times where we do get sort of the the, the memories of the past here influencing her present, um, but she is able to pull out. I mean, I think, you know, would this have been another one of those situations where it would have been cool to get sort of the, the name of the avatar and sort of what was the situation? Maybe it could have added a little bit more bulk to the chapter, which might have been cool to have, or maybe it wasn't really quite that important, but you do get to see a bit of like sort of the switching back from the different type of bending that she's having to do underneath the ground from the fire to the earth to the air to the you know just getting around in this sort of tight area space so that's definitely cool to see how you know the elements are being used in this situation as well um, but no I think this is definitely a cool sort of like in between point here of just getting from mm -hmm. A to B uh the next chapter here, uh, Outside Options, this is where, in a way, the book, you know, the, the proper plot of the book begins to come into play. This is why this becomes more than just a, a simple incident in this town. Um, so it, it's from Hancha's perspective. We see that he's sort of panicking. The other Shangs are panicking, waiting for him to come back in. It seems to describe that like he was sort of like crying almost in this situation. Like, in a way, the start of this, you know, why did this happen, happen to me on my watch? Um, but you get a little bit more of a, the, the actual sense. He has seemed somewhat reasonable around Yang Chen, but you see a little bit of that cruelty begin to come out here, where like he just sends one of his like watchers, it says here, Miki, up onto the roofs to look for, for Yang Chen in this terrible situation. Like the, the, it's icy, the, the structure is going to fall. And you see that just we randomly cut back to that over the course of this chapter. Like someone's on the roof, someone falls off the roof. Yang Chen finds an unconscious woman and tr does her best to, you know, get money out to, to look after her medical bills and stuff like that. Like, he doesn't care about these people and that it's even said here that, like, he made sure to get their loyalty by, like, forcing them into these positions by, um, you know, choosing people who would, who would have no other way to sort of gain money than to, to work for him. That's, that's how he gains his loyalty. But... The others are panicking. He comes back in and realizes, okay, look, there's only one way we're going to do this. And that is that we have to not do anything the avatar says. Do the simple thing. <laughs> Instead, let's get ourselves out from underneath the power of the Earth King. What about we use unanimity? And it's this kind of contrast of like the younger Shang merchants are like, what? And then the older ones are like, isn't that just like a, a myth, you know, like fr from like the, your predecessor talking about that? But he's like, no, it's true and it's finished and it will solve all of our problems. That basically this will give us enough like power to force negotiations with the Earth King. He won't be able to act against us because of this weapon. And all of a sudden the Avatar, you know, won't have any leverage whatsoever in this situation. We can just continue to do things as we have been doing, uh, free from from everyone, basically. And so he kind of, you know, builds this up. Like, he, he gets the support of everyone here. And it's like the, the future of the Shangs has been, you know, fulfilled here in all of this. Um, and again, it, it, it highlights, you know, that some of them are like, you know, you better make sure that I get what's coming to me. You know, like, they're all just about the, the money overall. And um, so he's going to send Sadao to John Dury because as Zongdu Chaisi in John Dury, um, she's the one who is in, who's currently in possession of the unanimity because she has helped to sort of finish the research on it and bring it to fruition. So Sadao is going to send that kind of uh, message because she doesn't really, you know, take messenger hawks basically. Um, and he, we just engineered this situation where, like, Sadao, because he's part of Yang Chen's retinue, kind of like, you have to force her to go to John Dury uh, to kind of keep her away from us. And you just have to sort of, in a way, try your best to keep her just going to the different Shang cities because she's going to want to try and talk to everyone about this. And that's the way to make this happen. And it's also a way for you to go to John Dury without sort of alerting the Avatar that you're doing anything wrong. We then get like a little bit from Yang Chen's perspective as she realizes that, okay, she needs to act against this, that she's listened to this. So she knows, okay, I'm going to John Dury because I need to intercept this weapon before it gets anywhere. She's considering what exactly it is. Like she has no idea what could give so much power to these merchants that they'd suddenly be able to 
do everything here. But this is where we get sort of her philosophy here. It's it's better to parry the sword than heal the wound. So that is why she is putting in the effort here of like, I'll stop the weapon before it ever does anything rather than waiting to see what the weapon is. Um, and so that's what's going on here. Like it's just preparing that, okay, to make this work, I need to finish my recruitment pitch to Kavik because I need Kavik. That, that, that's what she kind of comes to the conclusion with. So um, what are your thoughts on uh, that one? Finally, the unanimity being uh, kind of mentioned here. This is what actually turns this into a proper incident that needs to be dealt with. Yeah, there's a there's a lot that goes on this one. Just the whole idea of, you know, the merchants being at a point now where they're willing to take on, you know, the sort of drastic situation that uh, Zongdu has sort of brought up to, you know, be the potential solution for the situation here. And, you know, for the most part, some of them know, some of them don't know, but by the end of, you know, Henshe's sort of talk here, they're all sort of on board with this and, you know, it's, you know, Yang Chen is able to hear all this, which is just like the perfect sort of situation in terms of like information gather, not the actual situation that's happening here. But you can see that this really is, you know, boiling to a point here where there's nothing. You no, know, this isn't going to be like a good outcome, regardless of what happens here. Like, you no, know, I guess best case, you know, if Yang Chen can get in front of this, it would work out well. But like, there's still going to be something here that's going to have to be dealt with here. But you know, Yang Chen is pretty set on this sort of you know, path that she's taking here. And, you know, she, I think she mentions later on or in this chapter, like, what would have happened if she would have taken a different route with Old Iron here. So she's using that sort of idea. And that's her own sort of like past um, sort of regret is in addition to all of her sort of past lives where they definitely needed to be or in retrospect they thought that it should have been helpful to be sort of more active in the situation so this is definitely going to be her chance here to sort of confront whatever unanimity actually is um, before it becomes hopefully a potential problem here but no it definitely is sort of like really sort of setting the stage for what's happening in the future and really showing sort of like the cracks in uh, Henshe's sort of like facade here of he really isn't, you know, caring about, you no know, sort of the people or the city. He really is just about for himself, um, which is just sort of like how the Shang cities tend to work in general. And we're just really sort of seeing that in the forefront here as well as Yang Yeah, like the, the big thing for me for this chapter is just the lack of effort the Shangs want to put in versus the amount of effort Yang Chen puts in, that she's giving them the solution. They just don't want to be leaders. Like, imagine we have to implement reforms that the Avatar is telling us to do. Nah, we won't do that. Let's get this mysterious weapon most of us don't know anything about and gain power over the Earth King, and that will work out better for us. It's just this sort of like... They'll take the easy grasp for power over the help the people and slowly improve things and things will be better for you and you'll be better leaders overall. Like it's just that that sense of um, there's a difference between these sort of like mid to low level nobles who suddenly have a kind of high position and the actual world leaders. And there's that sort of sense of like there's no quality leadership among the Shang merchants, apart from maybe Chaisi, who we do get um, referenced here. But um, I, I, I like that contrast of just that Yang Chen's issues in this book are with people who are just not good leaders um, and are just out for money. Um, but anyway, next chapter, we go back to Kavik's perspective. And he is going to give the letter that he stole from Yang Chen to his uh, information broker, uh, Q. And it's it's sort of revealed like over the next couple of chapters that like, okay, Yang Chen knew about the letter that Kavik took. She's just let him go ahead with this um, as a way to just keep things going normally. Um, it won't matter. She usually spreads fake letters around anyway. So, okay, Kavik, fulfill your deal. This way you stay sort of undercover. You've done what you've been asked to do. Um, the first stage of this is that we find out that Kavik does this deal and he doesn't get money for it. He gets information in exchange for the letter. 
and Q tells him that he's found it, he's finally found something out about Kalyan, that he got a pass out of the city and left. It, it the the information is that it doesn't directly confirm it's Kalyan, but it's noted that like someone who only had eight fingers left the city, and Kavik's interpretation of this is like oh. It's as simple as that. Like he wasn't kidnapped or taken out in some way. He just got a pass and left and has never got back into contact with the family. So it sort of alters his kind of like goal, his mission and how he uh, feels about the situation. He still wants to know more, but it's changed things a little bit. Throughout this, we do get little flashbacks of like the first time the brothers like arrived at Bin Ur, stepping off the boat for the first time and just... Kalyan being a good brother to Kavik, um, but that in a way arriving on Bin Ur, things changed. And so we get this um, in a way from Kavik's perspective, what happened with Kalyan, that uh, he quickly left the, the usual job that the Water Tribe people take in Bin Ur. He started errand running. Uh, he got the family the new house. That, that's how they have the fancy house. He gave that to them. Um, but it seems like he, he basically did this by taking Water Tribe contracts and giving them like away. So he's basically messed up the reputation of the family within the Water Tribe district, uh, which is why Kavik and his family have a bad reputation among the other people and why like Kavik doesn't really have any friends as such. Um, and the chapter just ends with the idea that uh, Q and... Kavik have a little bit of a friendly relationship. They're but they're basically friends. Q is going to head for Taku with this information and hopefully make a better life for himself. Uh, but he does say, you know, like if you do find Kalyan again, like give him my best. So, just that, you know, his he worked for an information broker. He sort of respected to a certain degree, even if it is quite low level here. Um, I thought this was a really good chapter. Um, I like knowing the sort of Kalyan story of like you kind of wonder, okay, what happened here? He in, in a way, the information Q gives him here connects the final part of the story of like, oh, he was planning to get out from the start. That's why he was being so secretive. He just got the family a new house and left. And he felt that that was all he had to do. And you have these different perspectives on the character at this point. But um, it's an intriguing chapter because it does change how Kavik sort of views the, the whole Kalyan situation. Um, Otherwise, as we learn in the next chapter, this is just like the next stage of the, the Kavik Yang Chen partnership. But um, what are your thoughts on this chapter? Yeah, it definitely gives a pretty, you know, stark uh, personality or just sort of situational idea of how Kavik views his brother, um, Kailan, Kailan, and how he just, you know, it really seems like he just sort of like up and left in this situation here, which, you know, like you said, it definitely gives a different sort of perspective to how Kavik wants to deal with this. And you can definitely see sort of like the inner turmoil that he has over his brother, apparently seemingly just sort of leaving the family on their own you know he has still a lot of the sort of cultural try uh, ties to sort of the, the water tribe way of doing things so this you know is probably just as much as on the level as in terms of how caroline would um sort of stop working with you know the original group that they sort of worked with when they first came to the city here so with q sort of you know showing this sort of information here and you know the fact that you know they mentioned earlier on in the book that sort of like the information is like the most important thing in the city the fact that kavik isn't doing this for any sort of money like that just sort of also just emphasizes that sort of like idea in the city and we know that that's sort of been his you know driving force up until this point here so definitely you know it's another one of those like sort of intrigue spy aspect espionage type parts of the story that i think is pretty sort of intriguing the way that they actually go about it and it's towards you know Kavik's sort of hopeful sort of resolution of things but you can see that this just makes him even more sort of like depressed on the situation that he has to deal with even before the next thing that comes mm -hmm. up uh the next chapter is obviously when it's revealed that oh like right after q leaves basically yang chen sort of like walks in she's in like full disguise she's got like a wig on and um, 
like no one would know it's her basically she's she's fully covered uh she's got like bangs over her uh, arrow tattoo and stuff like that Kavik's very surprised by this but like it's like th- this fits you know yang chen of course she'd be a master of the skies as well so she tells him more honestly about like what is the job she tells him about unanimity um and that basically in exchange for this Kavik would like passes for himself and his family out of the city she agrees but they get across the idea that because of the way getting the passes works she'll have to get that like afterwards he will have to do the job first then the passes will come and there's just a little bit of a sense of like they don't completely trust each other at this point but they they get around to like the agreement of kind of what's going to happen you definitely get the sense that the the stuff with Kalyan from the previous chapter not having maybe gone the way Kavik wanted makes him a little bit more inclined to kind of like agree to um uh this uh, deal uh, so he kind of like okay fine let, let's do it she gives him one final test she does the whole like kind of lie detector thing asks him do you work for any of the shang merchants no who did you give the money to mama Unarak. okay and she's kind of like okay that, you, you passed uh, okay I'll, I'll trust you for now You know, and they just kind of like share a drink to like the start of their new sort of partnership. But there's still a sense where they're both like eyeing each other up as this happens. So the trust isn't completely there yet, but this could work out is is sort of the idea that you get. Um, There are some fun other moments with like Yang Chen constantly interacting with the guy who runs the tea shop um, to the point where like Kavik interprets this as like, the she's now a member of the tea shop man's like family that's how close they got just with their their conversations with each other and he he sees that like she is good with people and that as an avatar she likes to you know speak to the people he noted that with his family he noted that here with the person with the tea shop she asks them questions about their life to learn what the place is like so another point in yang chen's favor for kavik but um he also is a little kind of confused about how part of her is this like perfect avatar but then there's all this spying aspect what's going on there he's confused by her as well but what are your thoughts on this chapter yeah definitely he's very confused by her i think you know they really drive home the point that she really has like a different way of doing things than other avatars or at least from the current perception that people have of the avatar like no she's the fact that she's you know doing dealings in this sort of like back alley tea shop is something that like you know i think maybe not from Kevin directly but just from everything that he's sort of absorbed is just you know not how the avatar would do things um you know just the fact that she has to sort of like go through the whole idea of like really sort of like grilling him on like you know is he in the pocket of any other shangs is he really doing was from self where did he sort of give the money to it really speaks to sort of i guess what yang chen has had to deal with in the past as being an avatar and you know she hasn't you know she hasn't been alive that long but she's had enough you know experience and dealings with that this is a real sort of like you know factor for her you know trusting people and yeah like you said she doesn't you know they're not 100 percent on like a perfect trust level at the end of this uh, sort of chapter here but you know they can see that they have like a mutual interest here even if she doesn't particularly like the fact that she has you know basically a hold over on him because he wants to get out of the city but you no know, she can't really help with that until he fulfills his mission because otherwise there's no usefulness for her but you know he does make a note of that like this is like how things work in ben Ur, and you know welcome to the city and stuff like that so it seems like he's not like He's not like put out that he's in this situation just because he's grown up with it from this period of time. So he's like, okay, this is just how things are, even if you know she doesn't necessarily like that sort of situation that they're in right now. But no, definitely, it's a you know one of those cool sort of like dynamic character interaction chapters that we have here that really shows you just another step in where the relationship potentially will go in the mm-hmm. future. Uh, the last chapter that we're going to cover for today the northern air temple so straight away we get the idea like straight up kavik leaves bin ur something he hasn't been able to do this whole time and yang chen has just 
made it happen immediately. Uh, he's acting as like a member of this kind of like relief group, uh, kind of heading up the mountains like towards the Northern Air Temple. Uh, and he's just with them as they're doing all their, their stuff. They quit. They arrive at like a nearby hospital, basically, where is which is where he finds Yang Chen, uh, and she's healing everyone. And basically, we build up to this big moment where there's this woman who has a really bad fever. Uh, they need lots of water to heal her, uh, but there's no baths available. So Kavik is just like, got it. He goes outside, melts a bunch of the snow, brings in a big orb of water, and together in kind of like joint water bending. Uh, Kavik and Yang Chen heal this woman and it's this kind of notable like experience for Kavik to kind of he, he's not a healer himself but to sort of be connected to the water as healing is happening and together they make it work and he sort of um in doing this sort of like proves himself to like the abbot there um when otherwise he was sort of being critical of like Yang Chen and, and him for like you bring your spies with you like towards the temple like what are you doing Yang Chen but uh, he, he trusts Kavik a little bit more coming out of that. But the, when the woman sort of wakes up again, she starts talking about how, where's my son? My son is missing. And they realize that, oh, we thought it was just her, but she obviously had her son with her. And now her son is missing out in the mountains somewhere. And, and you get this idea that the reason that there are so many injured and sick people here in this mountain hospital, basically, is that this is the people just trying to like uh, force their way and escape out of Bin Ur, that they come out sort of unprepared, not ready for the snowy environment up north, and things go wrong, people get lost in the mountains, and this is why there's so many people to heal. So another result of the the poor management of Bin Ur is sort of the Northern Air Temple having to look after a lot of people. So an interesting kind of. Uh, using the the surrounding geography nicely here with the idea of like oh yeah binner a couple of it's a couple of hours away from the northern air temple and then the northern water tribe is just a couple of hours by boat uh, up from there so it, it's a nice use of all of that and again a nice moment of kavik proving himself that he didn't have to do this but he jumps into action immediately and really proves himself to the people around him that he cares about helping people here when otherwise he has sort of come across as maybe being a little bit business-like when it comes to the whole errand running thing but this is this is companion worthy material he's doing here so that, that's kind of good so uh your thoughts on <laughs> chapter 16 here yeah he definitely has uh the worthy sort of potential and they think they do a good job of uh showing that across here i think as soon as they you know start to tell this chapter of him sort of like leaving the city here even if it's under false pretenses you can you know get the idea that his you know way of thinking in the city you know can be swayed like he you know he hasn't been completely sort of i guess you could say like corrupted by the city way or ben ur's way or the shang city's way of thinking like you know he makes note of you know the different things that happen while they're going along the mountain pass like he's also like in awe of like you know seeing the the, the air temple when they first come up upon it outside along with the other people that in the sort of like group to like provide you know supplies to this sort of city here like even when they get to this sort of like land-based like avatar village here or air nomad village um you know he makes note of like all the different things that are going on and how like there's so many air nomads but not everyone's sort of like so in awe of them that they're sort of like tripping over their heels or anything like that so like you no know, you can see that he has you know not necessarily a completely sort of like jaded view of thinking of things and you know, the fact that he goes out of his way to actually sort of you know support Yang Chen in this endeavor of healing people like you know he he makes note of like you know there's way more people in here than there really should be because that's like one of his like particular talents that he has as like a runner um so no it definitely shows him in sort of like a, a different light that we've seen up until this point and you know it definitely works towards his benefit at least initially here in terms of like winning over the sort of respect of the people in the current situation yeah i think this is the chapter where we also learn about the um the people who live 
nearby the air temples but not in the air temples they're they're not air nomads but Mm -hmm. they support the air nomads like they're they're like farmers who like grow the food for them Mm -hmm. like i suppose follow some of the beliefs but they're not fully involved they're like pseudo air acolytes i thought that was an interesting idea to it logically makes sense that they would need that sort of support from the people around them and that there are these people who are fine kind of just being like yeah i'm more connected with the, the air nomads than i am with the earth kingdom yeah i'll happily like just be a farmer here and and give away most of my crops to to the air nomads because they'll help me i'll help them that was a, that, that was a, a nice kind of reveal as well just to know that like the 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 guy that kavik is with has to be like oh yeah yeah these guys they, they're not all air, air nomads they, they they just uh kind of help them it's uh it's a nice reveal but um yeah um big moment just to know that like they need a giant hospital there just because of how bad the situation actually is it is a bit weird the chapter is called northern air temple when it's only noted that kavik sees it off in the distance it's actually the next chapter that we actually see the temple but still we're, we're, we're there and thereabouts it's, it's it's quite good and um, but that is the first like third of the book it's the the plot has just about started. Yang Chen has recruited the companion that she wants, and we're going to get to actually going on the mission from here. And obviously, the idea is that Yang Chen is going to be having an official meeting with uh, the Zongdu of John Dury, while Kavik is going to have to be doing some like undercover errand running work, all with the aim of trying to find the unanimity which is somewhere in John Dury, and they have to try and figure out what it is. So a few more characters are going to get introduced here, of course, as we go on. We'll get some Kavik in action moments, more Yang Chen having her like official meetings, and we'll meet some very, very interesting characters and have a few interesting side plots along the way. So um, this is the intro section of the book. So you'll notice there wasn't really like a lot of action it is like a lot of Kavik and Yang Chen relationship dynamic setup, but it really works because we're going to get some emotional scenes with those two as we go forward. That really, you know, uses the fact that they already know each other relatively well at the point where we end here. So um, it's 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 a, it's, a, it's an interesting book in that like it almost like looks like it's quite slow. Like the first third of the book, not that much actually happens, but it's. Uh, it picks up speed quite quickly. So, um, what are your thoughts on just like this this first third of the book here, and and where we're about to head to? Yeah, I, I don't. Know, I think it could feel potentially slow, but I think because they're you know the way that is structured and the fact that they're sort of pushing forward towards like a specific goal, and you do have your characters that are sort of like you no. Know, moving towards like specific goals in mind it doesn't quite feel as slow as you might think because you do even if what they're going for initially doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things or you don't know how much it matters in the grand scheme of things like at least you have the idea of what Kavik is going for Mm -hmm. what yang chen is going for even before you know unanimity um comes into play you know you can see that there's things happening um yeah, it's not sort of like as action bending focus, but that's just sort of how, you know, they're setting things up before that all comes to pass. And then there is a lot more of that um, later on as well. So I think, you know, for me, it worked. It was, you know, interesting. It was intriguing enough. You know, it kept things moving at a relatively good pace. So it wasn't like too dragged out because I think that would have been a potential like down point if they did sort of like settle too long on like sort of like the meeting with the other leaders or sort of like more background of like what's happening in the city with riots and stuff like that then it might have been a little bit more dragged on but for me at least i think it it worked up until this point yeah because the the flow is quite nice because there's 41 chapters in the book but like obviously 16 of them are in like the first third because there's a sequence in this where it goes like you know six page chapter three page chapter six page chapter three page chapter so it goes quite quickly in terms of just like here's a more info focused chapter and then here's like a quick little action dynamic scene uh that just kind of helps to keep it kind of moving on pretty nicely and that like i you yeah i don't i don't think you can accuse the book of getting bogged down in politics because even when they explain like the platinum affair it's a really cool like quick brief overview that gets you right up to speed on what it is and then 
even the meeting that they have is relatively simple. It's just Yang Chen saying, I would like to do this, this, and this, and then basically just saying no, and that's your, your plot. Yes, as you go through the chapters, you learn bits and pieces about Bin or about the problems, and you learn stuff about like Kalyan, how the Water Tribe District works, and so on. But I, th I, th I think that all works, and it's the, it's just that typical FCE style of doing world building as he kind of uh, moves along. Um, and I, I think the highlight here is just that they devote a lot of time to developing this back and forth. Their, you know, banter is 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 really fun as we go through the book and it only gets better mm. as we go forward. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I, I gained a huge appreciation for this early section when I, when I did my chapter analysis videos and it, it does flow very nicely and that we're, we're fully set up at this point for the middle section of the book. So we'll be covering that, uh, next week on the podcast. But, uh, other than that, that has been episode 248 of the avatar online podcast. It's been myself and Greg. Thanks for watching and bye. Bye-bye.